Good evening and welcome to the Tuesday, December 15th, 2020 meeting of the Ann Arbor Planning Commission. This meeting is held electronically to protect public health and safety due to the COVID-19 virus and to comply with orders issued by the governor, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services and or the Washtenaw County Health Department. We intend to conduct this meeting similarly to an in-person meeting. However, please be patient if there are technical issues. Um, public comment will be via telephone only. And so to speak during any of the comment public comment opportunities, please call 877-853-5247 or any of the other numbers that have been published on the agenda. And the meeting ID for tonight is 995-7768-1361. This information is also available on the published agenda in the public notices section of the city website and on the broadcast of this meeting on CTN channel 16, AT&T channel 99 and online at a2gov.org slash watch CTN. And once you're there, you would select the government channel. Item number two on the agenda is a roll call. Mr. Chang, could you please do that for us? Uh, yes, Commissioner Abrams. Here. Commissioner Fish. Here. Commissioner Save. Here. Commissioner Lee. Here. Commissioner Gib Randall. Here. Commissioner Mills. Here. Commissioner Hammerschmidt. Here. Commissioner Milstein. Here. And Commissioner Clark. We have a quorum. Very good. And we're on item number three, which is introductions. And so those of you who normally follow Planning Commission might note that we had two new members in our uh, roll call tonight. Welcome, Commissioner Lee and Commissioner Clark. Um, I'm wondering if you could please briefly introduce yourselves to us and to those uh, who are following us on the broadcast of this. Commissioner Clark, can we start with you? Oh, you're muted. It's okay. Happens to the best of us. All right. Hi. Thanks. Um, so my name is Sidira. Um, I've worked in housing now for or nonprofit development for about ten years now. Housing has been my focus for majority of that. Um, I have a degree from the New School in New York in urban policy analysis and management. Um, and I alum of Eastern Michigan, and I guess I consider it my hometown. I grew up in Sio Township, right outside of town. Um, I'm really excited to be here and contributing and I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> well, welcome. We're glad to have you. Commissioner Lee. Yeah, sure. Um, I've been in Ann Arbor since 97. Um, I went to Bryant, Pattengill, Tappan, Pioneer, um, Michigan, undergrad and Michigan grad school. So I've been here uh, for a little while. Um, right out of school, I worked on zoning analysis for the D1, D2 adjacency to R4C. I created renderings for that. And um, since then, I've worked at McKinley as a real estate analyst, portfolio manager, and I'm, I've been with Oxford now for about five years. So um, I'm, I'm glad to be here. I think I, you know, I'm here to serve, listen, and uh, hopefully contribute in a meaningful manner. So looking forward to it. Well, we're glad to have you, and it's really nice to be up to our full contingent of nine again. <laughs> uh, makes it a lot easier to make quorum. So, um, item number four on the agenda is approval of the agenda. So, can I have a motion to approve the agenda or to move it? Uh, moved by Commissioner Milstein, seconded by Commissioner Hammerschmidt. Is there any discussion of the agenda as drafted? All in favor of the agenda as drafted, please raise your hand or say aye. 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 Any opposed? I don't see any, so great, the motion carries. Item number five is the approval of minutes from the previous meeting. We actually have two, two sets of minutes and I propose that we take them together. Um, may I have a motion to approve the minutes of the November 17th and November and December 1st, 2020 meeting moved by Commissioner Dish, seconded by Commissioner Milstein. Is there any discussion of the minutes? Seeing none, all in favor of the minutes as drafted, please raise your hand or say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion carries, we'll move on. 
Item number six is reports from city administration, city council, planning manager, planning commission officers and committees, and written communications. There are some written communications that I'm sure you saw in the packet. Um, council member Dish, do you have any report for us? I do, I have a brief report. Um, and I hope I'm not leaving anything out, but hopefully someone will correct me if I do. Um, at the last meeting, council approved the Bright Dawn condo proposal and made uh, an interesting modification in response to neighbor concerns about traffic cut throughs. And so there will be uh, the resurrection of a proposed gate that was in a previous iteration of this very long saga. Um, and it will be temporarily installed um, where the connection was going to be at, um, I think it's, was it Eli? Yeah, thank you. Even though you hear it said probably 50 times in the public comment, <laughs> my what the mind puts away. So um, that uh, it was a very constructive and polite and collaborative encounter between the neighborhood and council. And that felt good. I think they are excited to have Bright Dawn. They were just concerned about, you know, the way, uh, the way their neighborhood, the, the way the traffic flows in their neighborhood. And so hopefully that gate will, will really be temporary. Um, it is, of course, you can get through if you're an emergency vehicle, so no worries there. And then the other, um, may, I think the only other thing that's interesting to Planning Commission is that the, the sign ordinance did pass. Um, and it was very amusing because the mayor had to read all of those numbers every single time he called on us to amend it. And so it tested his enunciation and elocution, and I think he passed as did the sign ordinance. So if I'm forgetting anything, please chip in anybody. Mr. Chang, do you have anything to add or anything from the planning manager? There was nothing to be added from the planning manager. All right, very good. Um, are there any other commissioner officers or committee liaisons that have anything to report? been quiet on the committee front, I guess. All right, then we can move to item number seven, which is the first opportunity for audience participation. This is an opportunity for persons to address the commission for up to three minutes about an issue that's not listed as a public hearing on the agenda. So the three public hearings um, that are on the agenda tonight are for the St. Francis proposal, the West Huron parking lot, and the Lewis Jewelers proposal. So now is not the time to talk about those, but for any other matters, including if you want to talk to us about the communications to council for um, site plans or for the C1A, C1AR, um, this is your opportunity to do that. You can please call 877-853 5247 and enter meeting ID 995-7768-1361. City staff will select on callers that have raised their hand digitally, um, calling on you by the last three digits of your telephone number. To raise your hand, you press star nine on your phone. Um, you'll hear an automated announcement when you have been uh, moved to speak. Um, when speaking, please move yourself to a quiet area and mute any television or background sounds so that we can hear you clearly. You might also have to press star six to unmute yourself. Um, and at the beginning of your comments, please state your name and address for the record. So I see a couple callers on the line. Um, if you'd like to speak about an item that's not a public hearing tonight, you can press star nine and raise your hand and it looks like we have a taker. All right, caller ending in 534, you have three minutes to address the Planning Commission. Good evening. My name is Tom Stalberg. I live at 1202 Traver Street in Lower Town, Ann Arbor. And I wanna talk uh, about the C1A and C1AR uh, update. 
Uh, but I want to start uh, welcoming the two new planning commissioners uh, with a little review and background of the Lower Town issue itself, which is the reason we're here for the C1AR uh, and C1A review. Um, and I know there's only three planning commissioners left from uh, 2017 when Lower Town was before you, and even those three didn't see uh, a wealth of materials that have come out uh, regarding this matter since then. Um, for those who don't know, the uh, after it passed through Planning Commission, um, the Lower Town um, 1140 Broadway Morningside uh, application, um, the neighborhood hired uh, a top expert attorney, not to sue the city, but to educate council. Our attorney, uh, Susan Friedlander, did the research, she did the homework, and uh, we've been making all that information available to you. Uh, hopefully you've been able to uh, read my emails and the attachments. Uh, there's a 30 page letter from her from uh, late, uh, maybe November, 2017. Uh, there's the actual lawsuit filing, which is full of a wealth of both factual information as well as um, claims. Um, so my relationship to that is I am the official spokesperson. I'm a board member and spokesperson for the Neighborhood Association that did file the lawsuit uh, after it was improperly approved. Uh, and why me? Uh, I was a developer. I developed subdivisions uh, throughout um, Oakland County, uh, going back almost 30 years now. Uh, I've been presented to multiple planning commissions, city councils, township boards, uh, did a lot of rezonings, uh, did rezonings even when a master plan was required in order to entertain my application first which takes me back to some history here of uh, 2017, the summer of 2017, when Ethel Potts, who sadly passed away this past year, uh, Ethel Potts and I were in front of the city uh, planning commission, your body, saying that the process was wrong on this approval. And the first thing to note is that if you look at the March 31st, 2017 letter that I sent you all, uh, planning letter to the developer that uh, it properly claims that this is a residential development. Um, and that the site was master plan for mixed use. Uh, so at that moment in time, there should have been a master plan review for this issue, a revision um, process. And <laughs> if the communities, if the community had decided we no longer wanted mixed use on the site, we wanted residential, then the proper way to do that would be to have that master plan revision. I don't think we would have ended up with that conclusion given the momentum towards TSD and mixed use. And then we'd be done. We wouldn't be here talking about this right now because the master plan would not have been changed for mixed use. The application would have had to be turned down because it's a residential application, not a mixed use application. And we wouldn't have this discussion about why C1A and C1A are were so badly in, improperly misused to get around our zoning ordinance. Uh, so where am I with C1A and C1A are? If they're going to be misused, just get rid of them. They haven't been used in 50 years, 20 years, respectively. Uh, they That's weren't missed. They aren't needed. Time, Mr. And Stolberg. they've only been misused. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Caller ending in 556. Five, You'll have three minutes to address the Planning Commission. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. My name's Ralph McKee. I'm in the Fifth Ward. I sent you an in-depth email today, which I'm betting you probably haven't gotten through yet because it has references to several other documents. So I'll try to hit the main points in my three minutes. I listened to and spoke at the recent ordinance review committee meeting on the review of these districts and have reviewed the staff recommendations just submitted by Mr. Leonard. I'm not surprised, but I'm still very disappointed with that recommendation. It does not follow the direction given by council to analyze restriction or elimination of these districts and it ignores the public input provided at that meeting. Instead, the recommendation supports a vague expansion of use of those districts. The recommendation doesn't address properly, one, the original intent of those districts, two, the problematic and arguably illegal use in Lower Town and Garnett developments, which resulted in community pushback, a lawsuit, and the council directive that brought us here today. Three, their use allows developers to avoid including affordable units or paying into the affordable fund. Four, the difficulties inherent in having a district with no boundaries, and five, usurping the master plan process. The original intent is laid out in the Lower Town complaint and in the other letter that Mr. Stolberg just referred to. It was to complement campus business districts, not campuses. That's an essential point. Next, expanding their use can expose numerous neighborhoods to high rises next door with no standards for approval 
and without getting a single dollar for affordable housing, which would otherwise likely be required under other zoning uh, approval routes. Therefore, in my view, it's intellectually dishonest to advocate for use of these districts and at the same time claim to be for affordable housing. Those are inconsistent. Uh, next, the lower town approval is maybe the worst zoning decision in recent history. It cost us almost $9 million in affordable housing dollars. The complaint is essential reading. You just can't have a coherent discussion of this issue without reading that. Two main points. The approval process completely ignored applicable law in the master plan. The original planning report said the project was inconsistent with the master plan because it, one, it was too dense, and two, it wasn't mixed use. Somehow, Mr. Len Leonard managed to do a complete about face in on that issue without explaining why ever, recommended approval and got it passed. We shouldn't allow this to happen again. Next, I'm amazed that the affordable housing advocates in town haven't picked up on this issue. Every single use of this district or these, these two districts would otherwise likely fall into a category that you're working on right now, the PPMs, or maybe into a PUD. All of those would get us affordable housing dollars. So every single time that a, that a development like Lower Town is approved, it costs us affordable housing dollars. That's really, really important and needs to be focused on, and I haven't heard any affordable housing advocates pick up on that. Uh, so that's the the gist of what what my email says i would uh hope that you get a chance to read it and assimilate it you need to read those other documents thank there's a lot of detail but it's essential thank you thank you very much and we did receive that in a packet um the communication was passed along before the meeting so thank you very much for that if there's anyone else on the line who wishes to address Planning Commission on any item that's not listed for a public hearing, this is your chance. Uh, you can press star nine to digitally raise your hand. All right, seeing no one, um, I will close this opportunity for audience participation and again, um, in addition to the public hearings, there's another opportunity for audience participation at the end of the meeting. Um, and we'll move on to item number eight, which is the public hearings for the de next business meeting. Um, Mr. Chang, you have those? You're muted. Never, never fails. Okay, we have quite a few. Uh, the first one is for the fiscal year 2022-2027 capital improvements plan. Uh, this is a plan for city capital investments to be undertaken over the next six years. This plan describes projects that address needs for municipal and park facilities, transportation improvements, and utility infrastructure, along with proposed costs and scheduling. Upon adoption by the City Planning Commission, the CIP becomes a supporting document for the city's master plan. The CIP is also used as the source document for the city's capital budget planning. Uh, next, we have the Ruthven Nature Area Addition Rezoning, 3301 Gettys Road, a rezoning an 8.848, I'm sorry, 8.48 acre addition to Ruthven Nature Area from R1A, which is single family dwelling district, to PL Public Land District. This addition was purchased and approved by City Council on April 15, 2019. Uh, next, we have the Oakwoods Nature Area Addition Rezoning, 3382 Nixon Road, rezoning a 6.58 acre addition to Oakwoods Nature Area from R4A, which is multifamily dwelling district, to PL Public Land District. This addition was acquired and approved by the City Council on April 6, 2020. And then finally, we have amendments to permitted uses in the C2B and C3 zoning districts. A proposed amendment to Chapter 55, the Uni Unified Development Code, Section 5.15, Table 5.15-1, Primary Use Table, to eliminate warehousing and indoor storage as a primary use in the C2B and C3 districts. Thank you very much. And just to be clear for all of us, that those um, many items are going to be at the January 5th, 2021 meeting. So we'll see you next in the new year. Um, all right. 
the next item, or now we're on to section uh, nine within the agenda, which is regular business. I need to recuse myself from item number 9A, the St. Francis of Assisi petition, since I am a parishioner and donor to the project. So um, Commissioner Gib Randall has agreed to step in and I will be demoted and you'll see me once you're all done discussing. All righty, thank you, Chair Mills. Um, this is the St. Francis of Assisi, which is on 2150 Freeze Avenue per petition, which is a proposal to construct a two-story, 14,500 square foot parish addition on this 10.6 acre site zoned R1B, single family residential, in which church uses and expansions require special exemption use approval in a residential district. A landscape modification from installing the required parking lot via retention is also requested. We will start with a petitioner presentation for up to 10 minutes and Mr. Chang will provide any staff comments and then we'll have the public hearing before our commission discussion. Can we have the uh, petitioner presentation? I, I think you promoted the wrong uh, architect. Sure. Yes, I believe Mr. Kerr is for the, the latter for the, the latter project. Correct. Um, Chris Chang, do you know who um, yes. that's the correct? Yes, it's going to be either Dan or Brian. We have. Thanks, Rob. <laughs> Good to see you guys. Yeah, we'll see you in a little bit. <laughs> Be Dan Kohler, is Brian Bagnick. Hello, can you hear me? I just hung up my phone. Hello. Hello. Lots of feedback there. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Try. Try again. That, that sounds a little better. Why don't you give that a try now? <laughs> Any luck? Oh. Sounds good. Much, Much better. better. <laughs> Hello there. Any luck there? Hello. Yep, we're, we're, we, we can we can hear you. Can you hear ready. us? Hmm. Mr. Ken, can you hear us? Can you see me at all? No, I can't see you. They can yes. Me. They can hear me. Okay. Good evening. My name is Robert Keene, and I am the business manager for St. Francis of Assisi Parish. We are a Roman Catholic community of nearly 3,000 families in Southeast Ann Arbor. Established in 1950, St. Francis has grown from an original church building off East Stadium Boulevard to a campus spanning across approximately 10 acres. The community expanded steadily with its first addition in 1955, another in 1961, with the existing church building completed in 1969. In 1980, the Parish Activity Center, known here as the PAC, was added to provide gathering space, and a kitchen, which is shared by the school, several church groups, and various organizations from other churches and from within the community. Among its many ministries, St. Francis provides a Catholic education to approximately 425 pre-K through grade eight students. Additionally, religious education and sacramental preparation to more than 450 students that attend local public schools like Tappan Middle School across the street. And during non-pandemic years, our Vacation Bible School welcomes nearly 300 youth during the summer. We have an active outreach ministry to provide relief to those needing financial assistance, lacking food and shelter, or craving spiritual direction. Our ministry to the Hispanic community has grown in the past few years, 
and we are working actively to provide a spiritual home for our Spanish-speaking sisters and brothers in the Ypsilanti Ann Arbor area. The parishioners of St. Francis have provided general financial and material support regionally in Washtenaw County and throughout the Catholic Diocese of Lansing, as well as around the globe to missions in Katapuram, India and Kakamega, Kenya. Even with the PAC being in use for the past 40 years, the growth in our community has caused us to be without ample space on a regular basis. The construction of the new parish ministry center on the hill to the west of the church building will allevi alleviate this bottleneck to better support our diverse ministries, various school functions, and scores of volunteers that serve the community. Very simply put, more space to meet and congregate will allow us to better serve God and our neighbors in all respects. More specifically, the construction project of more than 14,500 square feet will provide ample seating for 600 people seated in rows for a stage presentation or school performance. The space can also be used to seat up to 300 people at tables for a banquet meal. There will be a movable wall that will allow the main hall to be subdivided into four breakout rooms for small group faith fellowship or to accommodate meetings of our outreach groups. A commercial kitchen and a shower facility are included in the design for when the ministry center is used for sheltering the homeless. There will be ample restrooms to support a large function such as a wedding reception or a funeral luncheon. The second floor will include modern office space for the parish staff to work and meet with parishioners. In summary, this latest project follows a long tradition of gradual expansion by the St. Francis faith community within our Ann Arbor neighborhood. Our building was designed to be practical, energy efficient, and cost effective, and there has been a successful capital campaign in place for several years to fund its construction. With us here tonight are our architecture firm, Hobbs and & Black, and our civil engineering team, PEA Group. We welcome input from Ann Arbor residents and questions from the Planning Commission as we seek approval from the city for our plans to build the St. Francis Parish Ministry Center in 2021. Thank you for having us here tonight. Anybody else to present on your team or shall we move on to the, um, the staff report? I think he's not hearing us. So Mr. Chang, can you uh, provide your staff report? I can. It does appear that uh, Brian Bagnick has raised his hand. Ah. I believe he might be making the site plan presentation. Got it. I'm not seeing the audio um, indication next to his Zoom name, um, so I'm I'm wondering if he's having an audio, unable to have audio also. Um, so he may he may need to call in to provide audio. Hmm. Let me see if I can get that number. And I'm happy to start the presentation um, if that's acceptable, just to, well, we don't have dead air. Uh, and if he can, happens to chime in, by all means, uh, he can take over at that point. That, that sounds good. Why don't we do that? And, okay. and perhaps if they're not getting audio from us, that he can have a chance just to, to call in. Okay. Uh, so I'm Chris Chang, the city planner on this project. For those of you not familiar with uh, St. Francis of Assisi, it's located off of Stadium Boulevard, uh, just west of St. Francis and north of Winchell Ave. It does have access off of all three streets. Um, and in fact, there's actually another access point from the neighborhood to the west. Uh, they are proposing a 14,500 square foot addition um, onto the site. And that's colored in the orange that you can see that the arrow that I've got on there. It'll be two stories. We will see what it looks like with the elevations. Uh, it does meet the minimum parking standards. It's uh, required to have, I think, eight, 800, a little over 800, and it's got uh, 880, somewhere in there, with the, that amount of parking spaces. 
So what they're requesting is a special exception use since this is zoned R1B single family. So any type of church and school use requires special exception use approval by the planning commission. Other items that will need to be addressed. Uh, it will need a variance from the zoning board of appeals and that is for street trees along West stadium Boulevard. I'll kind of put my arrow over it. It's very, very narrow between the sidewalk and the public right of way. So they don't have room to plant trees there but they have proposed trees on private property. So it will need approval by the Zoning Board of Appeals. They are proposing to meet the street trees that are along St. Francis and along Winchell Avenue. So they will meet the street trees along those two streets. They're also uh, requesting a landscape modification. Uh, that's for the bioretention. It is supported by our landscaper, our forester. Uh, because they're outside of the grading limits and it's a previously approved site plan. They're not going to touch these parking lots, the large parking lots. Let's see if we've got what other slides they have. I'm going to start moving through Hello, some Chris? of Chris. Oh, yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Sorry, I apologize. A little technical problem here on our end. Uh, but but th thank you. Thank you for filling in. I think you described uh, very much what we're, we're proposing to do. If I could just kind of walk through the plans real quickly. Uh, hopefully won't take very long. Um, if we can start on the east side uh, in the light blue color, that's the existing school, the K through eight school. Um, what Rob Keene had mentioned, the activity center that they currently have. If you look at the um, kind of toward the left of that blue area, you'll see that, yeah, right where Chris has his, his cursor right now, that's the existing activity center. It's, it's kind of a multi-use space. It's a cafeteria for the school. It's also the music room for the school. They've got cabinets for the instruments around the sides of the room. Um, that's the space that they're really trying to supplement with this ministry center. So it's, it's not like we're adding any people to the school. We're not adding any people to the church. What we're really trying to do is create a space that's more functional for the adults to use, um, a space that's more readily available for meetings, um, funeral dinners, lunches, um, wedding receptions and, and the other things that go on in the facility. Um, so if we could, and what Chris was saying, showing the parking lot, there's a gray stripe that runs through the parking lot. Uh, one of the things that the engineering division had asked us to do was to loop the existing eight inch water main. Uh, the site has a six inch water main loop right now. So the only real paving work we're doing is we're tearing up the existing asphalt to put in that new water main and then patching the asphalt. Um, again, the ministry center doesn't require any additional parking. Um, the parking is based on the church. The church seats about 850 people, so roughly about 283, 284 parking spaces. Okay, first floor plan, Chris. Can we go to the next slide? Uh, yeah, you can't see it? Not yet. No, we're not. We're just seeing that first slide. The first slide. Well, I've got. We're having all kinds of technical issues. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I can see it from at home, but it's a, it's a new share. Yeah. You got to go up, and it's like ah. a new share. Maybe close out and and share again, Chris. Okay, I'll close out, and I'm going to put in a new. Let's try. We wanted two. Let's do that. Here we go. Okay, thank you. I don't think we've ever had a presentation where there hasn't been a technology problem. Uh, we'll get it right just when it's all over and it ends. Um, this is first floor plan. Um, as, as Rob had mentioned earlier, that this is kind of tucked into the hill. So it's a one and a half story building. Um, what you're seeing on the south portion of this is the kitchen and the storage rooms, the toilet rooms, the mechanical rooms. The things that don't necessarily need daylight that are tucked into the side of the hill below grade. And then what you're seeing on the north side is this kind of this multi-purpose uh, ministry center. Um, the light walls that go through the space are operable walls that are intended to subdivide it into different size rooms uh, for different types of meetings and different conferences and activities that may occur. When all of the operable walls are open in that full beige space is available. It seats about 300 people at tables and chairs, and it seats about 600 people if they were seated in rows. And again, the, the big key here was they wanted a space 
that had nice ceiling heights. We got about 16 to 18 foot ceiling heights in here, um, a space that was very inviting and very usable, not a cafeteria, music room, multi-purpose room, all rolled into one. So if we could go to the, um, the second floor. Still don't have anything on the Still screen not yet. There, huh? yeah. <laughs> I'm not yet. There quite clearly right now. Let's. Uh... Let's try this again. Share screen. see here almost wow let's see here why is this it says your screen sharing is paused is that something i hit i think so okay let me let's try this again then it's paused let's try this again hmm Share. There we go. That's okay. the we got something. That's the roof plan. That's the roof. Okay, <laughs> let's go to the roof. Yeah. Let's see if I can get on the second floor then. If we can go back just one real quickly. Yeah, let's try it. All right, let's try it again. Let's try it again. Well, I don't know why it's, I'm sure it's operator error on my end, but <laughs> let's just see if I can get, while we're working on it, let me get at least get something that I can see that we've got in the site plan. Tell you what, let's see, can you at least see this for right now? Exterior elevations are up there now. Okay, do you mind? I'm going to see if I can open up the, the files, so open up the other ones. I'll reopen the other, the other sheets. If we can, I know it's going to be a little bit out of order, but I'm going to see if I can't open up. Okay. Let's see if I can open up the second page. If I may, I would suggest that we focus on the exterior if, we're, if it's getting clunky, just in terms of time. Um, because I think that's really what we're most concerned about in terms of the, uh, the planning commission. Um, so the exterior elevations or, or any other site issues, I think that's really what we are, we're going to be discussing tonight. So sure, if you could just sure. verbally describe what's happening in the second floor, I think that'd be helpful, but I don't think it's critical for us to see the floor plans of the second floor. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. Uh, the, the second floor is, is basically the offices, um, there are some parish offices right now that are attached to the school and we would like to do is move those offices up to the second floor um, they were they were put into the original building was like a, a, a not the convent for the nuns for the school so it was more of a residential structure and they're they're makeshift offices so we would like to create new offices make them fully accessible um, make them uh, acoustically appropriate make them more functional um, all on one level, all on the second floor. And again, because this is tucked into the side of the hill, they would all be 
um, accessible from grade on the upper level. And there's a few parking spaces off to the south side to accommodate the people that would work in the offices. Um, Chris had the elevations up there just a second ago. <laughs> and um, we've lost them again. But. Yeah. Hold on one second. Let's get that up there. Let's. Mm, you can't see them yet? Uh, not yet. All right. Let's. Let's try it again. I can see them at home, unfortunately, but those of you at home can't. Let's let's try this. You could try to share your entire screen instead of just mm -hmm. picking documents, maybe. Okay. And then as you sort of flip ah. through it, we should be able to see. Because it seems okay. like stop yeah, should keep stopping sharing. Yeah, it may be. It. We won't judge you if your desktop is messy. Well, no, you know what? <laughs> Just guide me through that, Commissioner Hammer Schmidt. I, I, I'm looking at the elevations, but unfortunately, you're not. And I have, you have to click. There. You have to share your screen again. Yeah. Because it looks like it, it looks like it stopped. So if you just click share screen and then um, click the top, like share left. your entire. Yeah. What does it the say? Like left. it's the top it's like left. Some... Choice. The top left choice in that grid will be to share left. everything. I don't have a chop left. I've got the share screen at the bottom, and that's what I'm hitting is share yeah. screen. Right. Then what does it what does it bring up? So it's like it's, a menu I'm going of like to try to share my to, screen, Chris. I think I found them. Did you? Great. I think so. Do you see? I do. Okay. Like plan we've got. Can you toggle sure. through it to show there you go? Yep. There Good we point. go. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Next one was the offices. If you could go one, one more. Yeah, that was the offices. You can see shaded in there in yellow. Uh, what you're seeing to the north is just the ceiling plan of the um, of the Paris Center. Okay, and the next one. Oops. Yeah, this one is is the roof plan, and what it kind of what it helps us demonstrate is that we've got a pitched roof on the Paris Center to match the pitched roof that's on the church. It's gonna be the simulated uh, cedar shake metal shingle. And then there's just a few flat roof areas where we're proposing to put the mechanical equipment. Uh, most of that will be concealed by this pitched roof. So if we go to the next one, the elevation sheet, um, the elevation at the very top, that's the north elevation. That'll be the most prominent elevation off Stadium Boulevard. Uh, we've only colored in the new portion on the right, on the left is the existing portion. Um, the church being a little bit taller than the parish hall because the church is more prominent, more important on the site. Um, the west elevation will be an elevation that's less obvious than the north, but still able to see from stadium. If you were traveling east on stadium or west on stadium, you would see this west elevation. And then the elevation at the bottom is the one that's tucked into the side of the hill. And this would be the entrance to the offices, parish offices up at the top of the hill. So next sheet. This is just a conceptual rendering um, that our design department put together to show how it would look if you were, again, if you were coming on stadium, going from the west to the east, you would see the parish center first and then the church in the background. Um, again, the church taller, more prominent element, but the parish center takes all the design cues from the church. Uh, we use the same brick, we use the same metal roofing, we use the same colors. Uh, we use the same style windows, um, the same uh, entrances with the little peaked roof. Uh, the idea was to keep it very traditional and make it feel like it was part of the campus, like it belongs there, like it was always planned to be there. Um, so again, we tried to try to keep it contextual as much as possible, uh, not necessarily trying to change anything that's there, just trying to complement it all. And uh, hopefully everyone agrees that we did a good job on that. Um, the parking lot in the foreground is the existing parking lot. Um, we will reseal it and everything when construction is all complete. So if there's any other questions or comments, be happy to answer them. Anything else to add, Mr. Chang, before we move on to the uh, public hearing? Uh, yeah, just a couple of other things just to add to the staff report. Uh, there will be three landmark trees taken down, and that's to accommodate the addition plus the stormwater detention. It does meet 100 years storm. They are over detaining on site because of the clay soils. Um, we also had a discussion 
if the electrical vehicle ordinance is passed before this petition is passed, we've been coordinating that the petitioner will have to install some electrical vehicle charging stations. Uh, at the time, right now, they're planning on possibly uh, uh, installing a couple of stations, but it wouldn't meet code. So we have had discussions, but it is not required at this time. So we're, we're looking to see where the, the new ordinance come in, comes into play. And then finally, I think when I was giving the presentation, I didn't speak on the parking. There is uh, 260 spaces that are required on site, uh, and they're proposing 282. They're not increasing the, the maximum number of students permitted at the school or the number of parishioners at the church. So if you have any questions, staff is going for or recommending approval for this petition, and I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chang. And now I will open the public hearing. This is an opportunity for persons to speak up to three minutes about the St. Francis of Assisi petition. Public comment may be made by calling 877-853-5247 and then entering meeting ID number 995-7768-1361. City staff will select callers that have, quote, raised their hand one by one using the last three digits of your phone number. In order to electronically raise your hand after dialing into the meeting, please press star nine under your phone. You will hear an automated announcement once the host is allowing you to speak. When speaking, please move to a quiet area and mute any television or background sound so that we may hear you clearly. Please state your name and address at the beginning of your comments. No callers have indicated. Okay, why don't we give it a little bit of time. Okay. Nobody coming up? One caller. Okay. All right, caller ending in 335, you'll have three minutes to address the Planning Commission. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Thank you. My name is Lisa Fine. I live in 2033 Medford Road. And I was wondering if um, one of the presenters could give us a sense of when they expect construction to start and complete, I'm very concerned about the noise that this is going to create in the neighborhood. Okay, we will make sure to address that during our discussion. Here, did anyone, this is Brian with Hobbs and Black. Did, we, uh, we actually or, don't usually answer these questions as they're coming up. We close the public hearing and then we have it as part of our discussion. So hold tight okay. to your answer and we will make sure we address it during our discussion. Okay, appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other callers? No callers have indicated. Okay, uh, now I will close the public hearing and read the motions. We actually have three petitions tonight, so I'll take them all together unless um, anybody has any objections. Anybody have a problem with that? Okay. Seeing none, the first motion, um, the City of Ann Arbor Planning Commission, after hearing all interested persons and in reviewing all relevant information, finds the petition substantially meets the standards in Chapter 55, Ann Arbor Unified Development Code, Section 5.29.5, Special Exemption Use, and therefore approves the St. Francis of the St. Francis of Assisi Special Exception Use for Church and School Uses. This approval is based on the following findings. The proposed uses will be consistent with the objectives in the master plan permitting churches and schools by serving residents in the district. The proposed use will not adversely impact traffic, pedestrians, bicyclists, circulation, or road intersections based on the location and the existing uses. A site plan documenting the existing and proposed conditions of the site has been submitted as part of this application. The special exemption use approval is based on the following conditions. The church, must, the church use maintains a maximum seating capacity of 1,000 persons and school occupancy is limited to 675 students. The floor area total for both the church, parish, and school does not exceed 78,000 square feet. The second motion is, reads as follows, that Ann Arbor City Planning Commission hereby approves the proposed landscape modifications in order to maintain the previously approved 
landscape plan according to chapter 55 zoning ordinance section 5.30.2a 2e subject to approval of the site plan and the third is the Annabur City Planning Commission hereby recommends that the Mayor and City Council approve the St. Francis of Assisi site plan subject to approval by the Zoning Board of Appeals to not plant street trees in the public right of way and installation of required EV parking spaces if the EV ordinance is passed before the site plan. Moved by uh, Commissioner Hammerschmidt, seconded by Commissioner Milstein. Okay, um, so we are in discussion. This is Brian. Commissioner Go ahead, Commissioner Lee. Oh, sure. Um, when do we expect construction to start and how long this will this take? Can we hear from Hello. the petitioner for that? This is Brian with Hobbs and Black. Did you want me to try to answer that? Please. Yes, that would okay. be great. Okay, we're expecting to go out for bids here in January, um, and then construction would start probably um, late spring, early summer, best case scenario. Um, obviously, everything's dependent on fundraising and making sure that we get diocese approval. Um, but that would be our goal would be to start in the late summer. We would probably take 14 to 16 months to for construction to be completed then. What level of decibel um, noises can uh, neighbors in tap and middle school expect from the construction? You know, I, I, I can't give you actual decibel levels, um, but we would we would restrict construction to you know hours of 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, we wouldn't necessarily have to do anything at night or on weekends. We'd like to keep it you know during weekdays. Um, there will be the usual, you know, trucks backing up with the beeping sound, which is usually the most annoying thing. And we'll try to make sure that we do those again between 7 a.m. and 4 p.m. Uh, that's all the questions I have. Commissioner Abrams. Hi, um, I noticed in the staff report, there was a mention of, um, neighborhood participation meeting and a note that says that you have not heard any feedback from residents regarding the proposal. Uh, and the, sorry, I'm just scrolling quickly to make sure that I don't misstate the date. Um, and I believe the postcard that's attached to the um, uh, report that we got cites a meeting from October, 2018. Uh, I wondered if, if there have been any other meetings or if, if, if there was anything to report from that meeting that might be of interest to this commission in terms of neighborhood support or opposition or just questions around the project? Uh, we, we had a couple of meetings. Uh, again, yeah, they were a couple of years ago because the project started in 2016 and it's it's been an effort to try to get everything planned and pulled together and, and organized. And there were a couple neighborhood meetings. I think one was in September and one was in October. Um, th there were a handful of people that showed up. Um, mostly the questions revolved around are you going to have a stage? Are you going to be able to do presentations for the kids? They, there weren't really any uh, objections or, or anything outside of that. It was mostly, you know, what's going to be the function of the space? How are you going to utilize it? Okay, thank you. That was my only question for now. Thanks. Okay. Commissioner Hammerschmidt. Thank you. To actually follow along with that, because I had a similar question, um, I noticed that the, the citizen participation meeting was a couple of years ago, and this is actually more of a question for staff. Do we have any sort of statute of limitations on citizen participation? Like, does it come to a point where it's been so long that we need to do another one? And I guess I'm asking because in a couple of years, new people could have moved into the neighborhood, have no idea that this project is happening because they wouldn't have gotten the postcard the first time. Yeah, there were actual minutes that I requested from the petitioner after reading them. I didn't think they were going to be that helpful. So I just included the postcard. So that may fall on me a little bit, and I'm happy to share. If you were going to e-track it, you could see the minutes. But as the petitioner was indicating, there really wasn't too much feedback or anything of concern. So I, I kind of left those out and just wanted to document when the, the meeting was. As far as uh, notification for the neighbors, I did post a couple of signs because it's such a large lot um, facing four streets. So there was that aspect. I, I had posted that, uh, I think, two weeks before the meeting. It's also advertised in the news. 
and also we uh, send out postcards within 300 feet uh, of the subject site. So the neighbors should be, you know, at least in close proximity, um, you know, been notified of the upcoming meeting. The one two years ago? No, no, no. For this upcoming for this... meeting uh, for, for tonight. Yes. Okay. There's been recent notifications in, in the last couple of weeks. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I was curious if there were minutes from that meeting. So good to know that they were pretty benign. Yes. Um, my only other, I guess this is not really a question. It's more of a comment based on the construction noise. I'm wondering if um, during the construction process, and this might be standard practice, but you might be able to put up um, a sign or something with contact information in case things get noisy or neighbors, I, you know, this is happening adjacent to a residential area, just in case there are issues or concerns that the neighbors have that they might be able to, you know, call somebody that could help them deal with whatever noise issues um, out of the ordinary might be happening. And I, you know, I think especially like we have no idea like where people are going to be working next year. We could all still be working from home so I can understand why there might be some concern about noise during the day. So that's a request to the petitioner if you could look into some sort of signage with contact information during the construction period. Yeah, this is this is uh, Brian with Hobbs and Black again. Um, typically, what we would do is when we award the contract, uh, we would have a, a neighborhood meeting with the contractor there and the contractor's field superintendent who's there every day. We would give that contact information out so that that person could be reached. Um, and they typically do get a phone call every now and then. There might be you know a little bit noise. There might be a little uh, dirt and dust in the road that needs to be cleaned up. Um, so that's what we like to do is have our kickoff meeting. Um, invite the neighbors and say, here's the person that's going to be out here. Here's where the trailer is going to be. Here's where the fence is going to be. One of the nice things about this project is all of the construction access will be off Stadium Boulevard. So there won't be any cars or vehicles or anything driving through any of the neighborhood. They'll come right in off Stadium where that existing parking lot is and they'll use that for their staging area. Great. Great. So just so I'm clear, if a resident does not come to that meeting, Will there be some signage or something that they know that or that they have that contact information during the construction period? We can post the number on the construction sign. Sure. No, absolutely. Okay. Be willing to do that. There'll be the names uh, of the owner, the owner, the architect, and the contractor will be on that sign. So we'll put phone numbers on there. Too. That'd be great. I think people just, you know, having it just in case they need it, I think probably makes people feel a lot more comfortable when they see construction projects going on. Um, other than that, I thank you for the presentation. The rendering looks Beautiful. It looks like it fits in seamlessly with what is there right now, and the space sounds like it'll be a great and flexible space for your students and parishioners. Thanks. Okay. Any other commissioners? Commissioner Lee. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's just because I'm new to this, so please excuse me if anything uh, seems out of order. Um, has there been any coordination with TAP in middle school? The only reason I ask is I just, uh, you know, ages, ages ago, I, I used to be there in the, the tennis courts and the basketball court kind of face stadium. So I just wonder if, uh, you know, when school does eventually go back in, um, if there's been any effort to kind of coordinate, you know, uh, it's, it's again, it's the construction. You, I just don't want middle schoolers, you know, affected by dust and things like that. So I don't know if that's ever been given thought. Well, that's just a comment I have, uh, just thinking about, I guess it's a little further down the road, but um, just just the thought, has there been any contact with like the, the middle school, just to let them know, hey, this is uh, this is happening and, and we can probably coordinate? Uh, it's... We, we haven't specifically reached out to them at this time, but I think they would certainly be one of the neighbors we would invite to this pre-construction meeting just so that they were aware when we were starting and what the hours of construction were and everything. And if there was any interference, like with the pickup drop off for the kids in the school, um, then we would certainly want to be aware of that and coordinate that with them. Gotcha. Th thank you. And, and as Sarah said, um, or Commissioner Hammerschmidt, I think is how I'm supposed to technically say it. Um, I, I, the architectural renderings, the materiality, consistency, I think all looks uh, admirable and yeah, flex space is really what uh, you know, I think is useful. So um, that's all the questions I had. Thank you. Any other commissioners? I have a question actually, um, and this is for staff. Um, 
with the, the not doing the street trees in between the sidewalk and the back of the curb uh, along stadium, are those trees still, the number of trees still included, but just elsewhere on the site, or are they just less the whatever it would be required, like 10 trees or something like that along there as part of their site plan? I can't say definitively. It's possible that the petition, the petitioner may know. Okay. Uh, during the review, I do know, I think there's only, a, in areas, there's only a two foot wide gap between the sidewalk and the road. So there just right. wasn't room for certain species of trees there. They did propose trees that were going to be on private property, but I can't say definitively if it was going to be the same amount that was required on the street trees. And I'm hoping I could either go back and look in the e-track or maybe the petitioner knows, yes, they are planting the, what was required. Chris? Could the petitioner ad address that, please? Yes, this is Tom DeMond with PA Group, Landscape Architect. Mm -hmm. Yes, the trees that, that are required along stadium now are on, the, on our property just outside the right-of-way. So, so okay, we need great. the number of trees, but they're just not in the right location. Okay, that's great. I'm, I'm glad to hear that because um, it's, a, it's a, a stretch that doesn't have a ton of trees that shade the street. And so um, the, the, I, I'm glad to know that at least they're going to be on the private property side. And when they get big enough, maybe it will they'll shade the sidewalk and the bike lanes there. So any other comments, questions from the commission? All righty. So I think we may be ready for a roll call vote, Mr. Chang. Okay. Commissioner Abrams. Yes. Commissioner Dish. Yes. Commissioner Save. Yes. Commissioner Lee. Yes. Commissioner Gib Randall. Yes. Commissioner Mills. Oh, I'm sorry, she recused herself. Commissioner Hammerschmidt. Yes. Commissioner Milstein. Yes. Commissioner Clark. Yes. Okay, motion passes. All righty, I think we are on to the next agenda item, and I believe Commissioner Mills will need to be promoted back into the meeting. So our next item is 9B, which is the 416 West Huron parking lot pavement improvement site plan for planning commission approval. Thank you, Commissioner Gibrandel. You're welcome. Thank you, UT. Welcome <laughs> Thanks. Um, you teed up the title of what's coming and while people move around, um, while the development team comes in and out, uh, I'll read what it's all about. So this is a proposal to reconstruct an existing parking lot, adding stormwater controls and landscaping subject to restrictions due to the Allen's Creek drain easement. The parking space count will decrease from 96 to 72 spaces. Four new bicycle parking spaces will be provided on this 0.81 acre site, which is zoned D2 downtown interface. Um, the petitioner is, is including two landscape modification requests, a uh, request to waive the requirement for trees in the interior landscape islands and two right-of-way screening trees due to restrictions of the Allen Creek drainage easement and a variance is also required here. So as per usual, we'll start with the petitioner presentation for up to 10 minutes and then we'll move to Mr. Kowalski um, before opening the public hearing and then our discussion. So do, um, do you have your full development team here? Yes, I, I believe we do. And um, Mr. Uh, Matthew Buds will be presenting for the uh, petitioner at this time. Great, whenever you're ready, we'll start the clock, Mr. Buds. I believe if he has permission to share screen in a minute. You... We can see it. All right, good evening. Can you hear me? We can. Yes, we can. Good, good evening, commissioners and staff. Uh, my name is Matthew Buds. I'm an attorney with uh, Moore Buds Law and I am working with the uh, property ownership team also on the call is Hugo Cerrone from SME, who's been providing the engineering for this particular project. Uh, what we have is a set of parking lot improvements and to give you just a bit of the oversight, that's the property, uh, if you'll recognize it, on West Huron, uh, just west of the railroad tracks, just west of downtown, I guess is the best way I would describe that. 
and uh, that's a view of the exterior of the property. We are talking only about uh, parking lot improvements essentially at this location. Uh, that will show you the area of work just again west of the old Ann Arbor Railway and on the north side of Huron Street. The current situation uh, inside that property is a somewhat deteriorating asphalt parking lot on the uh, southern half, I'll call it approximately, of the property. The northern half has on the uh, picture to the right the gravel parking lot and that stretches towards the uh, rear of the property, which is to the north. The overall goal here is to uh, rehabilitate and repair, resurface the existing asphalt parking lot and to uh, remove all of the gravel and replace that then with a contiguous asphalt parking lot uh, stretching to the north of that. The overall goals for the project are to improve the quality for tenants, customers, and the community. Again, describe the overall. Uh, there have been a number of, I'll, I'll say, hurdles to jump in and obstacles that we had to deal with uh, based on the nature of this property. Um, if you reviewed the plans, you'll see that the uh, Allen Creek easement, which is a county drain easement, runs uh, pretty much right down the heart of the parking lot property here, which makes it very difficult to, well, I'll say do much construction and certainly to plant any significant uh, trees or anything like that. Um, and therefore we had the, I'll say, dual challenges of adding uh, parking islands, but then also not really being able to, uh, due to our obligations with the county drain, be able to plant inside those. And so that's uh, the request for the landscape modification. We will also need to proceed with the zoning board for variance from the street trees because the, pretty much the only location where those could be placed also uh, within that uh, Allen Creek uh, drain easement. So those are some of the challenges that we were uh, dealing with there. Have a, a quick snapshot of the overview of those plans so that you can see again adding the landscape islands. The other part that I think will be uh, good for both the community and the property is the addition of the green space that is along the eastern stretch of that, that property. Right now if you see the pink uh, hashed line that's a, a retaining wall for the railroad that is right in that area. And the parking currently goes right up to that wall, which is, I'll say, been uh, deemed sort of an undesirable and condition that we'd like to remove. There is uh, the addition of green space uh, sort of bio area along that area, and then the addition of the angled parking spots all in that uh, general vicinity. There's also going to be uh, compliance with as many of the requirements as we could without having to be within the drain easement as far as uh, conflicting land use buffer, uh, addition of uh, plantings inside the interior of the property. And so overall, uh, it's our view that the improvements that are provided here will be better for the tenants, the clients, and the community. We're also removing um, impervious surface, so actually reducing that down and eliminating gravel parking, which uh, I'll say I believe uh, city staff and myself believe it will be an improvement uh, to the community and the property. Uh, also increase and bring the uh, parking lot into more uh, compliance with the city standards and uh, overall increase in the landscaped area and the green space. I think one thing that's important to note is presently there are 96 parking spaces in this parking lot and due to the improvements and the uh, necessity of complying with uh, some of the obligations that's reducing down to 75 but we think uh, will be an overall improvement to the project as a whole. And with that, I won't uh, take up any other time with presentation. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them, but hopefully that's a, a brief and succinct overview as to where we stand. Very succinct, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Kowalski, anything to add? Um, sure, I, I would just like to, uh, I'll highlight a couple of items really at this time. Um, as uh, Mr. Buds had mentioned, there are really the, the couple items I wanted to bring your attention are regarding a, the variance request in the landscape modifications. <clears throat> There's actually two landscape modifications that are being requested. Um, for one is for the uh, the modification to allow landscape islands, interior landscape islands, to be planted without the required trees. Um, we do have. Um, I'm sure this is a question will come up probably maybe by Commissioner Gib Randall. Um, we do have the amount of required landscape islands are provided in there. However, the trees are not provided. 
Um, and there, they are also providing vegetation in those uh, in those islands as far as like shrubs. The most that uh, the drink the uh, water resources commissioner would allow them to plant. Um, so that is regarding the one modification for the landscape islands to not have trees. The other landscape modification request is for the right of way buffer. Um, as you probably know, there's a buffer that's required between the parking lot and uh, the right of way. They have the required area, but they cannot put the required trees in there because of, uh, again, the Water Resources Commissioner uh, prohibition to put trees above. And as again, it's, we're not just talking an easement, I'm sure you all know, but the creek actually runs directly under the site, which is the, the reason, and it's not that deep. So again, the second modification would be to waive the requirement for right-of-way trees in the, sorry, not right-of-way trees, for buffer trees with the right-of-way buffer. The variance request is regarding the street trees. Um, so there are five street trees that would be required for the site. There are three that are currently existing, um, and those three will remain. However, the other two that would be required to be planted, again, are above, directly above uh, the drain. So the Water Resources Commissioner is now allowing them to plant those trees. However, that is not uh, an item that's eligible under landscape modification. So that would, if the petition is approved tonight, it would go forward to the Zoning Board of Appeals in the um, January meeting for approval of that variances. So the modifications um, could be approved tonight. Um, the, and if the petition is approved with the modifications, the variances will be approved in January. Um, and another no, another thing that I would be willing to point out here also that the petitioners, as you can see from the site plan, there's, there's a lot of green space that is at, being added to the site. Um, some things that are will become compliant, They're, they are providing the required conflicting land use buffer along the um, what, sorry, what, west side of the site adjacent to some residential. So they will have the required, <clears throat> excuse me, required trees as well as required distance in there. <clears throat> and um, also, as many of you may know that this site is directly um, in the uh, area that it was planned for the tree line master, <clears throat> sorry, the tree line trail and then that master plan. So the petitioner did work with us initially to agree to provide some of that, that land where they're removing parking that's now currently encroaching into the uh, right of way along of the railroad in that area. They're pulling that back, it's entirely upon their on their property now and there's an additional green space. So the petitioner did um, express that they would be willing to negotiate with the city or willing to grant an easement in the future for some of that tree line along that, along that area. So that is, again, it's not part of this proposal tonight. It's not being approved as part of it, but that was something that did come through these negotiate, or, sorry, not negotiations, but through the meetings to discuss staff requirements um, for this site. And as we noted, that was a master plan requirement and petitioners uh, agreed to entertain that idea going forward in the future. So really those are the key main items. And again, staff is recommending approval of both the landscape modifications as well as the um, parking lot improvements tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll open it up for the public hearing. Mr. Buds, if you wouldn't mind stopping to share your screen just so that, um, Thank you. Um, this is an opportunity for persons to speak for up to three minutes about the 416 West Huron parking lot improvements. Public comment may be made by calling 877-853-5247 and then entering meeting ID 995-7768-1361. City staff will select callers that have raised their hand one by one, calling on you by the last three digits of your telephone number. Again, you raise your hand by pressing star nine. Um, you'll hear an automated message uh, allowing you to, or telling you that you can um, unmute your phone. You can do that by pressing star six. And when speaking, please move to a quiet area and mute any television or background sound so that we can hear you. And please also state your name and your address at the beginning of your comments. Um, are there, it doesn't look like we have any callers. We'll give it a minute because there may be a TV delay. So in case people do want to call in.
being no one, I will close the public hearing and read the proposed motions, which I plan to take together, unless there's any objections. No, okay. Um, they are, the Ann Arbor City Planning Commission approves the 416 West Huron parking lot site plan conditioned upon a variance being granted by the Zoning Board of Appeals for two street trees. And the Ann Arbor City Planning Commission hereby approves the proposed landscape modifications according to Chapter 55 Unified Development Code, Section 5.20.3.A to require one tree for right-of-way screening where three trees are required and section 4.20.3.B to require no trees in the interior landscape islands where six trees are required due to the location of the Allen Creek drain directly below the site. Commission uh, moved by Commissioner Sauve, seconded by Commissioner Dish. We are in discussion. Commissioner Gibrandel. Is there any way that um, we could somebody could share the plan so that we could? Um, I'd, I'd like to get a better sense of um, where exactly the easement is and isn't in relation to the property, just so I can get my. Head I can. Um, oh, oh, there we go. I think. Yep, yeah, Matthew Buds, I believe is. There we go. Now, does this show your landscape plan on it too? If you could go to the sheet that shows where your your landscape plan is, there that go. would be helpful. And if you could just zoom in a bit. Um, yep. That's great. Okay. Um, so could you just let us know, is it that it's this dashed area in the middle that yes, we're talking so the, about the easement, correct? So the dashed area, correct. It, it, I don't think you guys can't see my mouse moving, but um, the, uh, the, yes. the dashed area, as you can see there, it's outlined. It says approximate location of the Allen's Creek drains e easement. That's, well, that is the location. What we don't know exactly is where that, that creek is kind of exactly underneath there. Yeah, right. But I mean, they have a really good idea. So, but that's the whole easement. As you can see, it, it, it cuts through the entire site. I mean, kind of any place that's not building. And as a matter of fact, towards the back, there is a building located on it. So, right. um, you know, that's a, it's an issue for any redevelopment of the site is kind of locked by this as well. Right, so. right. okay. And could you scroll down just a bit so we can see its interface with Huron as well? Okay, so um, so in terms of street trees, I'm just trying to get a sense of this: the, the building to remain the 416 West West Huron. Does that have existing street trees in front of it? Is that what I'm seeing there with yes. the green, or are those proposed? Yes, if you can see, those are exist. There's three kind of. If you can see the circles just yep. south of the existing building, those three street trees, three street trees are there. And then kind of if you, obviously, if you move over a little bit, there's a, that landscape island that doesn't have one. And then adjacent to it, there's a little area that also doesn't have one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I was just wondering if there was any kind of room on a different part of the site, but it looks like they already have street trees kind of placed placed in those areas um, and, already. And I did misspeak slightly about regarding the trees for the right-of-way buffer. There is one tree in the bottom corner there that does count for mm -hmm. uh, the right-of-way buffer trees. Um, and again, they are planning the required uh, shrubs in lower right. plants that are required yeah. for the right-of-way buffer, just not uh, the trees. Yeah. Okay, alrighty. I just wanted to get a visual on it a little in a, in a more clear way. Um, so this this lets me know, I think you know what's going about the limitations that they have, and and there's just not a lot of room. I was hoping that there might be places to kind of place these trees in other spots, but really everything looks pretty. Um, Pretty filled up. Yes, we did with the landscape, our landscape staff reviewer, we did um, look, or she did also look at that and we went back and forth about trying to like literally put, but between buildings or their, pro, you know, leads right. to, to buildings or mains, as you can see, it there, right. there just isn't. <laughs> yep, yep, I can, I can, I can see that. So, okay, well, thanks for, thanks for illuminating me. I appreciate that. Commissioner Gibrandel, do you have anything else? No, that was really, I was just trying to see if there were really any other opportunities for, for where to place something, because it is just such a, um, as Commissioner Mills knows, we're, we're, we're both kind of neighbors to this site, not too, not too far, so we walk by here a lot. Um, and it's a lot of hardscape. <laughs> 
It really is. So um, any any way to green it, and I'm glad that it's it's tightening and getting more efficient, um, so that there are some leftover green spaces, um, and that they're planting what they can. Essentially, um, just looking to see if there are any opportunities, but it looks like they've maxed out what they what they can. So. Other questions or comments from commissioners? Commissioner Gip Commissioner Abrams. Um, I wondered if you knew when those street trees were planted, because when I look on Google Street View, uh, there, the image is July 2019, and there are no trees there. I just want to make sure they, they maybe there are very new little uh, saplings, which is fine. <laughs> just want to make sure they are there. I believe. Uh well, from my landscaper said they were existing and they just redid that street last remember and i think they've gone through and completed yeah. the tree plantings and when i went out there i was pretty sure they were out there too but maybe okay. one of our commissioners that walks by the site because i did <laughs> double check and when i posted it so i think they put them in after they redid that street last summer well, maybe and i think they actually replaced it had to replace a bunch of them yeah that makes sense this fall. So if, anything, if we discover that they're not there between now and the city council, or if this is if oh, this moves forward, yeah, we can will be insert a, an amendment. But no, I just yeah, so that's fine. I just want to make sure they're there. Thank you, Commissioner Milstein. Commissioner Abrams, I am looking at the Washington County GIS, which just updated, and I can sort of see three little things coming out of the ground there. So One, I am pretty you. sure there's there's something there. More reliable than Google Street View. Thanks. Mr. Buds, it looked to me like you wanted that you had something to confirm. I, I did if it would be appropriate at this time. Uh, okay. the, the trees did, it's uh, my understanding, uh, died the first set that were there and were replanted as part of the street project. So there are three trees there uh, in a very uh, young state, I believe. Commissioner Gibrandel. Just one other thing I would say is that there's a really big honey locust there that looks really nice. And so um, just doing whatever you can to be able to protect that tree during the construction process. And I, what I've found in my own experience is that um, contractors just want to store stuff under trees. They just want to. And so the more you can try to, uh, you have, you know, tree construction pets and all that sort of thing, but to create some barriers around that to really try to keep that, um, that one going, I think is really important because it's really like the, the best tree in that area in terms of the species and the health and everything. And it's kind of amazing given its location, but anything extra you can do in terms of the construction process itself um, would be great to try to be able to support that tree through the, the rough time of construction. I assume, Commissioner Gibrandle, that this is the one that's right on the sidewalk, which is a nice tree. I was actually, I looked at the plan to make sure that that circle remained because it uh, um, it is well established. And yeah. so that's great. Yeah, it's a really nice one. Any other commissioner questions or comments? I'll just add that I do walk and I have to cycle on the sidewalk there because there is not bicycle infrastructure on the street. Um, and I appreciate it looks like there's going to be a stop line um, where like when you're, I guess, the Western curb cut. I feel like cars have been pretty safe there. That one is not quite as blind as the other side of the tracks where that alley is, which is super blind and super dangerous. Um, but I appreciate whatever, you know, the the accommodations that have recently been made um, and continuing that just to make it safer because that sidewalk is heavily used. Um, and so um, I, I think that this is not going to make that situation any worse um, than it is right now. So I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Kowalski, I think then, no, seeing no other hands, I think we're ready. For, oh, okay. Commissioner Lee, go ahead. Please, um, staff, please feel free to tell me, hey, that's not 
uh, something that we normally ask about here. Um, kind of talking about that, you know, a lot of pedestrians using that sidewalk. I'm looking at the signage, the monument signage that's on the sidewalk there, and I'm not sure if it's representing that particular building. Um, but it looks like a fairly auto-centric, you know, sign with a lot of diversity. I'm, I'm wondering, you know, we've done a lot of work on monument signs. Uh, from the ownership standpoint, is there any plans to either uh, redo the monument signs? Uh, I don't want to, you know, get off topic with respect to what's being requested, but as far as this particular site goes, um, it, it's a very auto-centric sign, very large. Um, just, just wondering, is that an appropriate question, staff? <laughs> Sorry. Uh. Yeah, certainly you can ask a question regarding signage on the site. That's not something that, that we would typically examine right at this point. However, um, they do, if they were, I mean, the commission, or sorry, uh, maybe Mr. Buds could comment whether they have plans to replace the sign or anything else like that going forward. So it is a question that could be considered as far as if it's blocking your visibility or if something else of that nature. So yeah, that's, that's absolutely fair. Um, at this point, I, like I said, I would defer to uh, Mr. Buds to see if they, if they have plans to, re, if they reface the sign eventually, things like modifications, it's going to have to be brought into compliance with the current code. And I, I have no idea, I'm willing to bet it probably isn't, but I, I don't know that. So a decent question. Uh, Mr. Buds, could you comment? The, any plans for the signage? Sure. Uh, at this time, I'm not aware of there being any plans. The sign hasn't been something that's been part of, um, I'll say, the focus or discussion as far as this site plan uh, has been. But that's certainly something we can go back and, and talk with the uh, ownership about and see if that's something that is, uh, you know, things move forward, that there could be improvement in that regard. And again, Commissioner Lee, I think it's a fair question because if our traffic, when our transportation and traffic team, when they do look at items, they, they do look at vision things like that, that signs that could be blocking vision. So, um, uh, I, I mean, I can't say for a fact that they did exactly on this one, but she did examine this site and, and felt that it was appropriate. So, yep. Thank you. Um, that, that's all the questions I had. All right. Want me to call the uh, roll call vote? Yeah, I don't see any other hands. Okay. So go for it, please. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Abrams? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Dish? Yes. Commissioner Sove? Yes. Commissioner Lee? Yes. Commissioner Gibb Randall? Yes. Commissioner Mills? Yes. Commissioner Hammerschmidt? Yes. Commissioner Milstein? Yes. And Commissioner Clark? Yes. It was a quiet yes, but I heard a yes. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't find you on my little cube of people. And I'm like, where is she? <laughs> okay, that, the uh, item is approved. And Thank so I'm sorry, w was this regarding, you guys took both, all the motions at the same time, correct? So this was regarding right. the landscape modifications as well as the site plan. I just wanted to make clear. Okay. Right. Thank you. So um, it needs to go to ZBA, but there right. are at least, so long as that is positive, it need not, it appeared from the motions, go to planning or to city council. Correct. Yep. So after this, again, pending Zoning Board of Appeals approval of the street tree, um, which again, for commissioners, you guys could probably figure out staff does support that variance. So, but that'll be scheduled for the January meeting. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. So, oh, sorry. I'll let uh, Commissioner Mills. Yeah. So um, we're our next item of business is 9C, which is the Lewis Jewelers Retail Plaza site plan for city council approval and special exception use for planning commission approval. Um, what I propose, commissioners, is that we hear the presentation um, by the petitioner and staff and have the public hearing, and then we'll take a break before we start discussion of that, just because we'll be about halfway. Great. Um, so this is a request to redevelop 300 South Maple, which is a 1.98 acre site zone C3 fringe commercial. Um, and looks like we have the development team. So as per usual, um, uh, you'll have up to 10 minutes to provide a presentation and then we'll turn it over to Mr. Kowalski to fill in any staff comments. 
Do you see everyone from your team here that you're expecting? I do. I believe Mr. Kerr is going to give the presentation and I see the other members um, also online. Excellent. Very good. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, can you all see my screen? We can. Good. Good. Okay. Great. Well, thank you for having us here tonight. Um, as you can see, uh, we're going to speak about 300 South Maple. Uh, it is a. Um, it was the um, uh, bistro uh, property that's been vacant for quite some time. Um, our project team. Uh, that's on the line tonight is uh, Steve Brower from A.R. Brower and Ken Candace Breyer from uh, Metro Consulting and Associates. Uh, and I'm Robert Kerr with Metro Group Architects, and uh, we're going to have a quick show of what we're looking to do on that project. All right. So if you all can see this on the screen, um, it is the existing uh, Corner Bistro. Uh, the building's been vacant for uh, a couple of years. It's at 300 South Maple Road. Um, it's a 1.98 acre piece of property, zone C3. Uh, the existing building is 9,330 square feet. Um, the way the property works right now, it slopes uh, from the west to the southeast. Um, and there's quite a bit of slope, uh, as you'll see in the way we responded to the property. Uh, there is an existing common parking agreement that uh, for, with uh, Westgate Shopping Plaza. Uh, again, um, to the north of the property is the Zinnemann's Roadhouse. Uh, Westgate is all along, um, uh, as you see in the back there, and then Kroger is to the southwest of us. Um, our, uh, our plan, uh, the model plan uh, shows what we'd like to do and propose to you tonight. Um, it consists of uh, three suites. Um, as you know, Lewis Jewelers is down the street on Stadium Boulevard. Um, they have been there since 19, or they have been servicing um, Ann Arbor and Detroit since 1921. And they're uh, very much looking forward to moving to the new site they would be in what we're calling suite number one, which is um, here. I'm hoping you can see my arrow. Um, and then uh, there are two other suites. We call this suite number two and suite number three. To the north of us again is um, uh, Chase Bank and um, uh, Zingerman's. And to the west of us is the shopping center. So uh, our plan shows here that we're uh, gonna, uh, we would like to construct 24,000 square feet. The building will be 28 feet high. Uh, we're moving all the building down to the uh, east of the property and uh, right up on to South Maple. We're right up at the uh, setback line, the 10 foot line. So we're right up at the street. And uh, we do have and are requesting a, um, drive through here at the base uh, next to suite number three. We um, are looking for a tenant there right now. We do have patio space out front for dining. So we're expecting that the possibility of having somebody like a coffee shop that would be serving coffee and then have the ability to sit outside and to be um, in the, um, uh, out, out, being outside would be great. Additionally, uh, on the site, we're showing another patio area. We're, we're thinking that this would be another opportunity for uh, some sort of uh, quick dining location with outdoor dining. And then um, there's a, we've created a, a park here, if you will, sort of a green space within, um, a, you know, within the shopping center that uh, folks could uh, sit there and have uh, their lunch if they'd like to. Um, some of the um, things that we've shown here, uh, we've responded to some ideas and requests that a sidewalk that uh, to connect from South Maple into the shopping center. Uh, so we've 
uh, gladly uh, propose a sidewalk here to allow pedestrians into the property um, to either go up to the shopping center or on into our uh, center. Lewis Jewelers will be here. Uh, their main entry is um, on the north. And then we will have uh, four tenants. We're up to four tenants here with their face uh, entry here on the uh, on the north side. Uh, the sidewalks are uh, wide, uh, excessively wide, or they're doubly wide. Uh, the intent there is if, again, we wanted to have some kind of seating out there or just a, a break from uh, the pedestrians and the parking. At the rear of the property um, or um, uh, here between us and the um, shopping center, again, we have a green buffer and um, we have um, quite a bit of uh, landscape um, for all of us to uh, uh, actually in excess of what we uh, are required to. There is uh, underground retention um, and um, we have on, on the property, again, some of the statistics, vehicle parking for 81 people, 81 cars, 10 bicycle parking, and then on the north side or the uh, west side of the property, excuse me, we have some EV stations that are being planned for electric vehicles. Um, so with that, uh, let me go to the next slide. This is just the architectural breakdown, just showing you the suites um, and how they will be divided. And um, this is a uh, um, rendering of the facade from the north. Uh, this would be the north elevation. So the main entry into uh, Lewis is here. And then the other four tenants from suite number two and then the, the uh, patio area and the other two suites are here um, on the, that would be on the south side of the property. And looking back on the south side of the property, um, shopping center is over here. This is the bank. And then uh, Zingerman's is up ahead there. And this would be the drive-through area. And again, the outdoor seating and patio area here with a patio and green space here. Um, so that is our description of the project. Um, Steve Brower and Candace are here. If we have any questions on the um, site plan, Candace would be happy to talk about that. Uh, and Steve is um, the general contractor. Very good, thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Kowalski. Sure. Um, thank you. I don't <clears throat> really have a lot to add. Um, I did want to, as, as commissioners have noticed, we are requesting postponement here tonight. Um, really, the, the main item regarding the postponement is, uh, is a transportation review that we're, we're still waiting for um, a final review. And, and really where the concern lies is regarding the, um, the drive-through and its, its location. As my report notes, um, this is, this is more of a revised plan than what was originally reviewed by the transportation engineer. So this version had come back uh, the, last week that shows a two-way drive on that south part of that site. Um, previously, it was a one-way exit only drive. Um, our transportation engineer expressed concerns regarding that because of the uh, use of this, this area that goes through. It's, it's kind of an aisle way that goes directly through to Westgate to the west. Um, and there is a recorded access easement that um, requires two-way traffic through there. Um, so with that, the, the petitioner has uh, agreed to convert this back to a two-way ingress, egress aisle way. Um, however, uh, so again, the, the review of that has not been completed, but where the transportation of my preliminary feedback, she did have some concerns regarding the queuing of cars at the drive-through and whether or not that they, they could jut out, you know, they could stick out in the traffic. Um, again, depending on what type of use it is proposed there, I mean, some drive-throughs can have quite a bit of traffic as we see, especially nowadays. Um, and if, that, if the cars were sticking out um, at that end, it would be sticking out directly into the traffic lane, that, that through lane there. So, but I do not have a final confirmation on her official review at this time. Things that I can add to it is that it, it was, it, the. The source of the drive-through itself is, is not 
sorry, the source of the concern is not the drive through itself on this site. However, it's more of the, the location of it here um, and perhaps that the drive arrangement and the queuing line. So um, again, but one of the reasons we wanted to put this before planning commission tonight is also to get some planning commissioner feedback on the drive through use as well as the general site plan layout. Um, as I said, my report staff supports the, the, the site plan layout in general. I mean, it, it's offering a lot of upgrades to the site as it currently sits now, now with no existing detention um, and landscaping out of compliance. Also, one key feature that we wanted to stress here, which is something we had requested and the petitioners agreed to install, the, is the sidewalk connection that goes from Maple to Westgate. That was a pretty important connection. Um, there is, and again, as you all know, Westgate's a pretty popular um, shopping center and it gets a fair amount of uh, vehicular as well as pedestrian and non-motorized traffic. There is no direct link to Maple right now, so that sidewalk would provide um, a nice linkage directly to the Westgate site. Um, they are providing the required amount of electrical vehicle parking spaces that will be installed um, compliant on the site. They're located on the, on the west side of that site. And um, also regarding parking, they are at the, the bare minimum of parking of what's required, which again is obviously allowed and, and preferred in some um, instances. And as you know, and they do have a cross parking easement with Westgate. However, it's not necessarily needed because they have the required parking um, at, at the site already, but that was an easement that's been in place for quite a while. So um, really with that, um, that kind of con concludes my staff presentation at this time. And um, as I or put it back to Commissioner or Chair Mills. Thank you very much. And um, Mr. Kerr, we may well ask you to share your screen again uh, later if when we have questions, but if you can um, stop sharing for just the moment uh, during the public hearing, I think that might be helpful. Be happy to. Thank you very much. So um, now I will open the public hearing. This is an opportunity for persons to speak for up to three minutes about the Lewis Jewelers Retail Plaza site plan. Public comment may be made by calling 877-853-5247 and then entering meeting ID 995-7768-1361. City staff will select callers that have raised their hand digitally. You do that by pressing star nine. Um, you'll be called upon by the last three digits of your telephone number and should get an automated response telling you that you've been um, enabled to speak. When speaking, please move to a quiet area and mute any television or other background sounds so that we can hear you clearly. And please also state your name and address for the record at the beginning of your comments. Um, I see that there's one caller on the line. If you'd like to speak about this item, you can press star nine to raise your hand. Give it a little bit of time too, in case there's the delay with the broadcast. Seeing no one pressing star nine, I'll close the public hearing. And before we enter into discussion, why don't we take a five minute? Is that okay? A five minute break. We will reconvene at 8.50.
I see everybody all squares filled. So um, I will read the motions. There are two of them that I'll take together. Okay. The Ann Arbor City Planning Commission hereby recommends that the mayor and city council approve the Lewis Jewelers Retail Plaza site plan subject to obtaining the required off-site private storm sewer easement and the off-site public water main easement prior to the issuance of any building permit. And the second one is the Ann Arbor City Planning Commission, after hearing all interested persons and reviewing all relevant information, finds the petition substantially meets the standards in Chapter 55 Ann Arbor Unified Development Code, Section 5.29.5 Special Exception Use, and therefore approves the Lewis Jewelers Retail Plaza Special Exception Use for one drive through lane as part of a retail use. This approval is based on the following findings. One, the proposed use will be consistent with the C3 Fringe Commercial District zoning district, which provides commercial activities accessed primarily by automobile. Two, the proposed use will not adversely impact traffic, pedestrians, bicyclist circulation, or road intersections based on the location. South Maple Road provides access to the site and the proposed use is consistent with other surrounding uses traffic impact. Moved by Commissioner Hammerschmidt, seconded by Commissioner Milstein. Um, as discussed, the staff recommendation is for postponement, but if there are any questions when we see this again in, I think it was proposed maybe in February. Does that sound right? Yeah, they, we, and again, they requested to a, a date certain so that commission, uh, it, it could give the petitioner and staff a, a definitive timeline. But as always, again, that, that was, that's a, a staff thing. I mean, it's always open for planning commission um, discussion as well. Okay. But when we see it then, if there's any things that you would like, questions that you have or comments in the interim, this is an opportunity for that. Commissioner Milstein. Thank you. Um, so I have a lot of questions and concerns regarding the drive-through. Uh, more importantly, it has to do with uh, just access points and trying to figure out how many cars can fit into the, into the drive-through and what traffic might occur because of that. Um, I just think that we are looking at having um, quite a bit of traffic and, and because that drive, even when Quarter Bistro was there, was heavily used. Um, I see this as being something that's heavily used as well, just because a lot of people get that driveway confused with uh, the Kroger driveway. So not only are they going into uh, Westgate, but they're also going to the uh, Kroger parking lot. And, I'm not sure if that's gonna be super safe. So I have a lot of concerns around that. Um, so I would like to get a better idea of how that driveway is gonna, or how that drive through is gonna operate and how the cars are going to be queued um, and how the parking around that area is going to work because I think that's gonna be a, uh, a major issue that I think we're gonna to have to sort through. At this point, I'm in favor of the development uh, that's there. Um, but I'm not, if, if the drive through is what it appears um, that it's going to be, I'm not in favor of granting that um, special, special exemption use for that. Um, the other thing, oh, and just to bring up uh, an item in regards to the drive through, um, I frequent some drive throughs, especially recently with what's been happening with uh, the pandemic. But similar situations arise at, for example, the Starbucks at Ann Arbor Saline Road, uh, right by Meyer. That's sort of right on Ann Arbor Saline Road. That is a somewhat of a similar drive-through, and that has you know where cars are queued up and they are into the main road at that point. So that's problematic. The other drive-through that I'm thinking of that's ha having a similar concern is the bank drive-through drive-through for uh, the University of Michigan Credit Union on South State Street where the cars are literally parking in on State Street to get into the drive-through, um, just because there's not enough room for people to maneuver around that area. So drive-through is my biggest concern. The second thing is uh, that I wanted to talk about is the trash. Um, I, you know, I don't know if anybody's talked to Westgate, but uh, having a trash container that's pointing right at the Westgate Shopping Center uh, doesn't really, look all that great. 
um, especially if you are right there at Westgate um, and you're looking out into the trash uh, where the trash containers will be removed. Um, so just getting a better understanding of what that's going to look like as well. Um, so those are my concerns at this point. Thank you. Commissioner Hammerschmidt and then Commissioner Clark. I thought you were going to say something different about the trash, but that's a good point. My concern is actually the fact I, I like that you've put in this this green park space, but then this trash is like right the corner of the park. Um, so besides, I think I share similar concerns about the drive through. I, I think when this comes back, I'd like to see a little more detail about everything that Commissioner Milstein just said, but um, the, the garbage right by the park um, was my my other big concern. I love that this is pulled up to the sidewalk. I think we need more of that around town. So I, I love that this is working to um, really activate that stretch. Thank you. Go ahead, Commissioner Clark. Okay, hey, so um, I hope it's okay if I ask for a little bit of clarification on the circulation um, here. And I'm just wondering if I'm understanding and reading it right that when if traffic enters on South Maple, that they're going to have to cross across the exiting drive through traffic because it, it looks kind of like the people exiting the drive through in order to exit are going to have to cross over the entryway traffic. Does that make sense or is it, can they kind of clarify a little bit on that? We could, if, if you want, I mean, I could, I could bring up my screen share if you want to see the yeah. image of that. I mean, I know then that kind of blocks out. Uh, so hopefully I have uh, better luck than Leonard Chang on this, but I should. Um, I've been practicing and it works fine every other time. So in theory, it should, did that work? Yeah, we got to see your desktop. Yep. Hey. <laughs> Yeah, take that, Chang. All right. Um, okay, so yes, the really the traffic circulation, I, I guess, overall, I mean, your main concern was, I think, regarding you had mentioned through this drive through. And as you can look, um, so in general, though, I'll just really quickly, this is the another, you know, the main access drive right here that goes into the West Gate. That's the existing drive now and the existing uh, curb cut into the Lewis Jeweler site is about right here, or kind of right there where you can see that. So they're kind of shifting that over and they still maintain an access to the rear there. Um, so those that, that access is the, is the same as existing. And then, so right here is the, is the main point of contention, I believe, which is you can see the two-way traffic is maintained here, but correct. I mean, this is the full, how the traffic would enter here. And then obviously, yes, you would have to cross the traffic entering the site there to just to get to the exit to leave so i i believe that was your area it's kind of your question correct yeah, um, so in that area there the circulation my concern is just kind of the traffic in westgate to begin with like i have um my daughter loves going to the library there so we're always over there um in normal times but you know walking around the parking lot even when you're in the area you know cars are kind of going every which way to cut across and that, that was my only question is if the traffic um pattern around the drive through i'm not a big fan of drive throughs i think it's great that it's going to be closer to the curb but then i kind of wonder if the drive through negates that benefit a little bit um and just kind of the general walking patterns of people from the sidewalk enter in on south maple entering people into that dynamic with the traffic i'm just kind of if we're adding more conflict points there um but that was just my only concern on that and that's a it's a good point again that that the traffic and that circulation that was that main concern that was identified from our transportation engineer regarding that the cross uh the exiting traffic and the amount of traffic that westgate generates um you know to and from so that that's actually one of the major concerns with why that drive wanted to be maintained as two-way and the new element of the sidewalk there is just uh, something to know Do you want me to keep the screen up for now or, or I can stop sharing if there's another commissioner question? And I have a question about that, so I'll jump in now. And I also think that, um, Mr. Kerr, I feel like I saw you raise your hand. So if you have, if you wanted to respond directly to that, my, or maybe I'll ask the question and then let you respond to both of those kind of things together. Do we have any idea how many cars, based on the the queue right there for showing the drive through, how big? It's difficult for me to get a sense of scale about how many cars can fit in there. What if somebody is at the at the window at the building? How many like 
how many cars back is it to that arrow that's kind of pointed northeast? Right here. I mean, I would. So if you can, and I'll, sorry, I'll let uh, Mr. Kerr answer as well. But I think if you can see across here, these are the standard parking spaces, parallel spaces right below there. Um, so I mean, using that as kind of a, a guesstimate. I mean, depending on where their drive up window actually is located on the building, and then you also have a concern which is where a menu board or ordering board would be located um, on there as well. So I mean, it looks like probably two, Max. three cars possibly, but. Um, I will, uh, maybe Mr. Kerr can add to that right now. Thanks, guys. Um, so yeah, we, we were planning three in the queue there. Um, so that there'd be three. Um, I know that there's concern with that and we can lengthen that uh, drive aisle uh, to make it longer. We can push it forward more for the, for the window and allow for more cars. We could probably allow for five uh, cars to sit in that queue. Um, when we bring it back, we can show that. Um, one of the things that I wanted to, to mention, um, Matt, you talked about uh, a, an easement or a, um, you know, an, a, an agreement that, that the, um, the rest of the shopping center can use that drive. We're not aware of that. That's, that's not, there's, there's not been an agreement that we have uh, in our paperwork that shows that that property um, has to be a two-way drive. And we proposed it as a one-way drive, understanding that it was it would be better for traffic circulation, but traffic said no. We want to maintain it as two. So we would prefer it was a one-way, and we would prefer that it's it's not uh, set up for that collision, if you will. That's my only comment. I I could say just. To well, they respond to that. Um, we did, when we looked up the actual, we got the easement language for the easement that's cited on the library page. And it does specifically state for two-way ingress and egress access. But we can, um, I mean, I, we can certainly send that back to the petitioner and let them look. And, and not to say that it couldn't be changed eventually, but that was what our interpretation as well as transportation, it says must maintain access to and from through there, the library page. But we can, again, we can certainly sort through that in detail. But I think even, and, and he is correct that there was originally proposed as one way. That was um, a big, that was a def definitive uh, pushback from our traffic engineer that absolutely did not want that converted to one way due to the amount of traffic that goes in through that drive to Westgate. And again, this is the main, if you look up at the traffic pattern that goes up along West Stadium and well, kind of where it bridges into uh, Maple and West Stadium there. This is one of the main access drives that allows left turns into the site. Um, so, and then left turns out. But anyway, so that, but it, so with response to that traffic concern is where the petitioners come back with a two-way drive. So again, and that's where we're at right now for um, that's being reviewed. I would to, to that end, like while we while we're talking about that and the safety of the drive through, because that's one of the standards that we have to think about when we think about drive throughs. I, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure to in my mind, the one way seemed safer, the queue issues seemed lessened by having it one way. Um, and I do think it does get confused. The first time I drove to that Kroger, I thought that that was the entrance to the Kroger. I subsequently learned that it was not. And so, you know, you make that mistake one time. And if there's a one way sign, then you realize that. Um, what I'm actually like, I'm not so worried about cars. I recognize this is a car centric potentially like there are this is very frequented, but this is also one of the most accessible grocery stores by public transportation in the city. Um, and like Commissioner Clark, like we're often there in nice weather and non COVID times and usually arrive by bicycle. And um, I and that's like, you know, that's one of the ways to to get in. But I looked at where the bus stops are. I confess that I don't usually take the bus here, but you could. And the bus stops are actually south uh, on South Maple are south of this site just a little bit. And so what I worry about from a pedestrian safety point of view with that with the drive through is that that is where 
foot traffic going to the bus stop from the shopping center, like maybe not Kroger, because they're just going to go out the Kroger parking lot, but farther up could be using that because it's a straight shot, right? They're not going to walk to the, to the north end of the property. I appreciate having the sidewalk by all means, but without having a pedestrian access along that south part of the, the um, uh, drive with those cars coming in and out and to drive through, like that is my safety concern. So I'd like to better understand that or to have that looked at, to think about like where people are going to go, like what the paths of travel are to the bus stops. Um, because I, I often see people waiting for like at those, at the various bus stops. And I'm, I don't, it, I don't entirely know myself, but I, they're not gonna they're not gonna walk to the north of the property like it just will seem to be as uh, that since that one is closer to those bus stops i think that they will tend to go towards the south so that's my concern over the drive through and safety commissioner gibrandel yeah just one one more thing i think about the the drive through and that is even if it's a one way if it queues up in any kind of you know if you have a few cars they're going to be blocking the parking lot as well in the interior parking lot. So the drive through just seems really tricky in through here to me. Um, so it doesn't, I mean, I don't know if you all have tenants yet or not. I know we've had some drive throughs with banks and things like that where they have a, a specific tenant. The, the way you made it seem is that you're sort of trying to attract one. And so I don't know that that's like an essential part of it. I mean, that's for you all to figure out, but I, I just see the drive through here is really problematic, no matter how you slice it whether it's one way or two way and two way just seems ridiculous to me, like the crossing of the traffic and the way that I, in both kind of on both ends of it, it just, it seems like it's completely counterintuitive. Um, so I, I'm like Commissioner Milstein, I'm for the development, but I think that the drive through is a real problem. So I would have a really hard time supporting it with the drive through the way that it is. Commissioner Sovey. Yeah, I was just going to add, I'd definitely be interested in seeing the easement language. Part of it is because if you look at the Stadium Maple intersection, there is a Westgate sign at the light. It's very small and people don't follow it, but you're supposed to turn left into South Maple to enter into this driveway where people do turn left into Westgate from the turn lane for Jackson. Right. And so you've got people like stuck at Jackson trying to turn into Westgate while other people are trying to go through the turn lane to turn at the light. And so if this goes one way, we're going to get one less entry point and we're going to get more conflict up at that light going from Jackson where we're going to have more Westgate entry, you know, gap there. So thinking of like right now, it's like the tail wagging the dog about a drive through requiring one way to make it safer. But in, in the context of this neighborhood, going one way creates more traffic congestion and issues and risk taking to turn left up at that other Westgate entry too. So the traffic flow of this whole thing has to work in concert. And so I can understand why there's probably an easement here trying to get people to turn at that light to manage this as an entry point as a right turn. So I'd definitely be interested in seeing that language when this comes back. And it's hard for me to support a one way to make a drive through work to the detriment of traffic flow for this overall area servicing the community. And so that's where even if you can go one way, it's because you want to go for a drive through, not because it's bettering the site. And when we look at special exception use, there is some assessment into the overall need uh, and quality of it. So it'd be really hard for me to support it as two way, right? driving into traffic, uh, exiting the drive through and one way thinking about the overall traffic flow in this area. So overall, the drive through doesn't feel like a fit here. Just my feedback now, it's up to the petitioner of how they present it moving forward, but uh, it's giving them the opportunity for the heads up right now. And one last little thing is that there's no sidewalk connection to the patios of the suite three. So we've got the South Maple sidewalk. I'd love to see just a sidewalk going to that patio. Um, because right now it's like you're either walking in the driveway or walking across the grass. 
And so if there's any accessibility issues of somebody taking the sidewalk, say from the bus stop to this, um, I don't see a way for them to navigate to those suites uh, without a sidewalk connection. Any other commissioners have feedback? Commissioner Milstein. Mr. Kowalski, it would be great if the traffic engineer can be here for our next, uh, for whenever this comes back to us. Um, so if you can please ask uh, uh, Cynthia to be here, that'd be great. Yes, I appreciate that. Again, we were thinking about it for tonight, but there wasn't enough feedback to really give at this point. So, I mean, we're getting a lot from you guys, but there wasn't enough for her to really give. So, yep, that's a great point. We will definitely do that. Uh, one one uh, follow-up note that was just mentioned regarding that sidewalk to the front suites. Um, I think the petitioner can also uh, chime in on this a little bit, but there's a, a pretty big grade change there. So I think they would have to add steps because we did inquire about that with planning stuff to access that. And I, I think that there would have to be steps in that location. Um, the architect or uh, in, engineer, there's can you guys north. clarify that? I don't know if it should match. That's I how I'm sure if, uh, <clears throat> If they, well, either way, we can definitely have that advised. I thought we had pointed that out and there was a great change issue there. That there is. Candace, can you, is Candace still on? She could, maybe she could chime in on that corner. Oh. Yeah, okay. so the, the slight generally slopes as you're going along Maple. So we were able to make that pedestrian connection at the northeast corner, um, but even that's pretty steep. It's actually, it has railings all along it just to make it ADA compliant. Um, and you can see there's steps on that patio in the southeast corner, um, kind of coming out of the building to get to the patio um, for access. So um, we can look at it again, but if there is any type of pedestrian connection from that patio out onto the public walk along Maple, um, it wouldn't be ADA compliant. So I guess the question is, is it better to have a connection with steps to have a connection or does it have to be ADA compliant? Um, that's, I guess, a question for the city. I'm, I'm sorry, Candace, you're saying at the southeast corner, this where the hand is now, that's what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. So a connection from that patio directly out to the sidewalk would be too steep um, to meet ADA requirements. Um, and I think the city generally requires that all connections to the public walk be ADA compliant. So um, we could look at potentially putting steps there to make that connection. Um, but uh, there's not a way with the grades to make um, just a, a standard sidewalk connection work, work right there. And you know, if, com if commission would prefer steps, we could um, again, we could request that they can install some steps or, and they would not be ADA accessible. I mean, for me, I guess, cause I raised it, right? Like when I basically try to draw a line of a pedestrian moving around this site, once you get to that Southeast corner, you're, you're going all the way around the site to the inside entry of those suites or you're cutting across the grass. So like making sure people can get from a, public sidewalk onto the site without walking in a driveway, I think is the ideal scenario. So, you know, just, and it's helpful, you know, when they come back and do a full presentation to maybe talk through those scenarios too would be great. Or elevations that kind of show that, like what it looks like. I mean, what actually I didn't realize that there was such a difference between that patio and the sidewalk. And it makes me wonder then if whatever, I mean, it's not a retaining wall because now there's a patio on top of it, but whatever is up there, like what the sight line is now from that sidewalk or from that, from the in and out, the driveway to the sidewalk, because I think that that's, you know, that is a sidewalk that gets used. So um, I think that to that point, that might, that would help me next time to look at that. Commissioner Abrams. Um. There is on uh, towards the end of the, the second to last page of the site plan review set that we were given some renderings that show that elevation along Maple. And if I'm reading it correctly, I think the there is a retaining wall, like the kind of 
adjacent to the sidewalk, what the pedestrian would be kind of walking adjacent to is a small grassy berm, a retaining wall, and then the building. Uh, so, but I just would encourage my fellow commissioners to look at that. Oh, there. Oh, whoops. It's page 20. Yeah, if you're concerned about yeah, that. Yeah, it tapers off. And that's where it's just like questioning a little bit more of the push and pull of the landscape to be able to slice something in right at the end. Any other, I, I, I saw that, but I didn't, it didn't register to me like where the driveway was. So I'll go back and look at that. Um, and it's not necessarily that I need a 3D rendering kind of what, what it looks like from the sidewalk, but I think that just so, I mean, it, if you can't pick up from this discussion, the for the special exception use, I think understanding how that entrance and exit on the southeast side works, like, like there's a lot of convincing that needs to happen about the, uh, about the pedestrian safety right there associated with that. I think overall, like, like the other commissioners, I think that I'm excited to see this building. I'm excited to see it moved up to the road. I'm excited that it's that it's um, thinking about parking in various ways and not like tons of parking. It's not like a sea of parking, right? Like it, I like that it's on multiple slides. So I think that there's lots of there's lots of good here. But uh, to what Commissioner Sauvé said about you know if you know, if the one way is only to solve the the drive through, like that's not that's not what that's supposed to be for. So I'm I think I, that's clearly like you know that that's the area that you're going to need to pay attention to. But like, if you can't hear, that's the area really to pay attention to for coming back. Um, Commissioner Lee. Yeah, I, I just wanted to. I think everyone has really great points, and I just wanted to uh, actually say I, I'm really actually I really like the layout of things. Um, I like how it does pull the building towards the road. It helps to slow traffic down on South Maple with the landscape uh, kind of buffer on that side. So I just want to say overall from a materiality, kind of what the elevations look like. Um, I actually really like what's proposed here. I think it's better than what the quarter bistro used to be. Uh, and then in, in addition to that though, uh, again, the, the question of how, how I think there's a question about the sufficiency of that stacking lane. Um, could you imagine it going all the way back? Uh, I had a quite, you know, in my head, I did think about how it fits in with the overall, like, you know, you got the roadhouse, you know, kind of got a funky architecture and how it fits in with the other numerous outlots that kind of sit there with, I guess Chase is pretty uh, <laughs> sterile, but I, I um, overall, I think the design is great. We have to address this ingress egress issue and then the sufficiency of the stacking lane. Uh, and I think that that's really, uh, and, but uh, overall though, I think uh, you guys will do a phenomenal job. I mean, I have great respect for what AR Brower does, uh, you know, all, all across uh, Dexter and Ann Arbor. Um, so I'd love to see that issue of the grade as well as the stacking lane and the ingress egress conflict get resolved. And then we'd love to see the, I mean, I think this has been in the works for quite some time. <laughs> so I'd love to see this. Obviously time is money in the real estate world. So uh, I'd love to see, you know, that get addressed quickly. Uh, the question I have for staff um, would be on the actual application for special exception use, does it have to get revised number seven, uh, the relationship of the proposed use to main traffic thoroughfares? And road intersections. It does say there it's a one way exit is proposed, blah, blah, blah. Does that have to get revised and like resubmitted essentially? Yep, we would have them revise that. So, again, depending, we're waiting for some additional feedback here tonight from the commissioners. But yeah, that, that's just a simple, just to update that to reflect the current layout of what's right, what the special exception use, if approved, will actually grant. So yeah, that's correct. That will be updated to reflect one of the reasons, again, we're kind of waiting for that to see what the final layout may be, if this in way, two way or whatever, so that they, if they need to update it. But yes, that will be updated so that when you guys vote on this, if it's approved, it will be approved um, pursuant to correct language in the special exception use. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, and then last question, this one's for the petitioner on the last page of the um, revised site plan, page 21, you guys have a photometric analysis. Does that usually get um, like the analysis, does that fit into the larger site in the city as well? I see, you know, it's, it's quite dark kind of on the peripheries, just, it, just for my edification, um, is that done in concert with the existing lights that's kind of like surrounding it? Uh, or is that just kind of independent? I, I like how you're using LED with the specs on it, but um, just a question if that was considered I, I, for safety of like walking all, all along the site. I can address part of that actually, maybe in the petitioner can if, if they can add something, but typically that's only done on a per site basis. So they're only looking at their actual site there. It's not, and I think this is where your question, it's not, we don't get photometric plans in relation to how the other sites are, mm -hmm. yeah. um, how that lighting is. It's only, so unfortunately we kind of do this at a piecemeal, uh, you know, kind of work is that once one site comes in, their existing lighting is all brought up to current city codes and everything. But what's surrounding it on the other sites, no, I mean, Westgate, <laughs> is, <laughs> although they've just redone some things, so they may be closer to being in compliance, but we just look at each site as a photometric plan to see that that site kind of stand alone by itself. Okay, got it. Well, thank, you. Lighting standards. thank you for the clarification. Overall, I think I'm, I'm excited to see this come to reality. So it's not a vacant former quarter bistro. So that's it for me. Thank you. Before I entertain a motion to postpone from uh, my one of my fellow commissioners, I'm wondering from the um, petitioner if there is a date in the future. The the what the proposal from planning staff was February the first meeting in February. Based on what you're hearing, do you think that's reasonable or um, yeah? We, I think we would prefer to come as quickly as possible uh, to keep the project moving. If there was a date before February, we would like to do that and we can meet the time, the time frame. I think Matt, I mean, that's, that's, I mean, we only have a few things to take care of. And Mr. Kowalski, from your perspective, re remind me of, I always forget the pros and cons of like having a date certain versus a date unknown <laughs> um, yeah. for this. Yeah, well, one of the, so the first meeting of January would not be available. And the, so the first possibility would be the second meeting. Um, the planning manager had concerns regarding the, the amount on that agenda, but, um, but also it, this could be scheduled. I mean, really the concern regarding the date schedule is just to make sure that we have, depending on what the feedback was tonight, whether planning commissioner was, or planning commission in general was, you know, if they would be pushing for more of a, a redesign, we don't want to do it too uh, too quick because we won't have we'll be back in front of you saying staff didn't have time because obviously the petitioner needs um, time to reflect your comments here tonight but then again we need time to kind of follow up with that and if there's any major concerns regarding if there's redesigns that you know the drive-through lane adjusts the only problem with that is once you know it's that trip trickle effect if they kind of adjust one thing on the that plan, then, you know, engineering, everybody has to kind of go through that long list, list of reviews again. So the only thing we didn't, well, in theory, it, it is correct. They don't have a lot right now. We're just, we were waiting for the transportation feedback on the plan. But again, given what we hear, what they hear tonight, whether or not they want to do larger revisions to the plan or not, depend on, on, that depends on staff timing after that and their timing to get it back to us. Um, and I and know the petitioner would like to go forward as soon as possible, but we also don't want to, and then you have, everybody knows we have a holiday season coming in here, which unfortunately for better or for worse also affects reviewing times for everybody. So um, we're, we were trying to balance something where I know the petitioner wants to get this addressed as soon as possible, but we also don't want to push it where we have something back before you that's an incomplete plan um, or that we have to request postponement again. But, and if we <laughs> just postpone Without, um, without mentioning a date, then could, and, and then, then it comes before us when it's ready. Yes, and then we could. That that's also, and we may be able to make again with conversations. I'll follow up conversations in the next couple of days with the petitioner. We'll hear back. I mean, if there's not a lot of major changes, I expect to have the traffic review done on the plan. That it, that with the two-way drive that you see before you here, um, hopefully really soon. 
Um, and if there's no other major changes, then that can work out fine. But if there's other major changes regarding IELTS and things like that, then we get into that ripple effect where engineering might have to look at again and then landscaping and so forth. I'm willing to entertain a motion from <laughs> a commissioner, unless there's more discussion before we, Commissioner Milstein. I move to postpone to February 5th. Just a minute. Com Commissioner Milstein, February 2nd. Yeah, it should be February 2nd. Sorry, looking at the wrong year. Wait a <laughs> minute. February 2nd. I was say, we don't meet on Friday nights. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> you want to put us back in 2020, did you? We, we might as well start meeting on Friday nights. There's not a whole lot happening. <laughs> it's it's true. It's true. Um, the so the motion has been made. Second it is that is there anybody who would like to second it? Um, seconded by Commissioner Sovey. Discussion of the proposed motion to postpone this until the f the first meeting of February. Seems realistic to me personally, like. And it gets us on our agenda so that we don't have ridiculous amounts of things on the agenda too. It's also for the you know the petitioners' benefit that we're not here all night. Is it a question? Um, how, how, did, uh, how did how did the petitioners feel about that date? Uh, I guess I'd like to hear from you guys what you think about February second. Well, we we would like to be there in January. Um, because I think that what we heard tonight, um, I think we have a, I, I think we could we could say we have a direction that we're going to have to go to to get approval for the next, uh, and it's not going to take a whole change of the site plan to do that. So if there's any way to get us in January, it would be great. Um, that that's our that's our feeling. And I guess then I'll direct the question at um, Commissioner Milstein why uh, February would work better if, uh, if, if they can make minor changes that would help to address all of our collective concerns. Uh, um, is, is there like a particular reason that you were thinking February? Sorry, I, if you could elucidate on your thinking there. Sure, it's based on what Mr. Kowalski was saying that, you know, if there are major changes to the plans, it has to go through all the city departments. Um, so being that we're also now middle of December and pretty much the rest of December is shop because of the holidays, re realistically, you know, with the way the city works, I, I, you know, the last thing we want to see is, you know, people watching at home are expecting this to come back on February 2nd and it doesn't, or if we move it up and make it February or January, our second meeting in January, and we can't meet that date. You know, I, I think it's better for, uh, to give staff plenty of time to review this, as well as the traffic engineer, uh, plenty of time to review this, especially if they are going to come in, if they are going to be coming back with a drive through. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to defer to your guys's, you know, expertise. I'm new here. So I, I just want to make sure to, you know, keep the petitioners in mind, you know, time, time does matter quite a lot. So I just know what that means. So, uh, so I, I'll yield. Um, Thank you. If I may for a moment. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. I think it's obvious that we just need to delete the drive through. That makes all these concerns pretty much go away. And doing that would certainly make this thing reviewable in January to be ready for your second meeting in January because the old traffic engineer's concern is the drive through. So if there is no drive through, basically, there is no concern. And the changes that Candace would have to make to accommodate that are very minimal. I, I could say that does seem, sorry, can I? Yes, please. <laughs> I mean, that does seem realistic. If that is the direction that the petitioner would want to go, I would uh, tend to agree. I, I hate making promises on city review times, but it, it would be just a, I mean, if they eliminate the drive through, uh, again, that does eliminate the ripple effect of changing plans. I mean, they can more or less eliminate that lane and put parking there, put grass there, and there's no more review. So that does change the, that changes the equation to, uh, 
Commissioner Milstein, Milstein's uh, motion and, and my concern, which was expressed, that what Mr. Brower just said does does change all of that. Now, whether or not you guys, it's ultimately up to the Planning Commission, of course, to to set that date for postponement. But um, yes, that does change significantly the amount of time staff would probably need for review. Commissioner Dish. And I just want to, that sounds really sensible. Um, but I do think the concerns about the trash being next to the park, it would be good to, not that that requires major engineering, but to remember that. And then there is the decision about, you know, whether you install an escalator to be ADA compliant for the uh, Southeast corner. And I am kidding. <laughs> if I may, one other thing, the, the, the trash area is the exact area that it's been for Westgate and or for the Quarter Bistro, the Mexican Fiesta, whatever that was in Mountain Jacks before that, if you can, some of you remember back 40 years ago, but that's where it's always been. So it's nothing new or different to any of the tenants in Westgate other than this one would be actually a much better location than they have now in terms of the construction of the existing dumpster screen on the site. Well, it, it will be, now it is required to be brought up to code. The one that was there previously is not to code. This one is screened properly with gates that have to be closed and things. But, but yes, we will put that as a concern that um, will be noted as well. I might chime in that since the speed of review depends largely on whether or not that drive through is there and how much engineering and review that takes. If it, that potentially just leaving it open-ended and letting it see how quick it gets through the process um, doesn't seem in my mind to cause any harm. And so if it, if they're able to go, we will, I feel like it doesn't make sense to bring it before us if it's not ready. Like, having this three times just seems silly that's n no good for anyone so if um that it gets brought before us when it's ready and if that's quick because you know the controversial thing has been taken care of and you figured out what to do about you know the couple of other items then great and then if not then um as quickly as it can come i think would be my inclination rather than tying us to a particular date Commissioner Sobey. I'll just say, like, I think we, we stay for a typical practice to put to a date, uh, especially when we have kind of community input and so that we're, we're putting together a date when people are listening. Uh, I don't know who's, you know, watching on the TV or streaming or whatnot. I mean, there could be 40 people figuring out the outcome. But um, since nobody called in for public input, uh, and we haven't received any letters. I, I feel I feel comfortable, and I'll I'll leave this to Commissioner Milstein's um, proposal. But uh, since there wasn't too much, I'm not too concerned with an an open ended date from my side. For that reason, Commissioner Milstein. Commissioner Sway, there are four people watching us on YouTube right now. So not a multiplier of ten. <laughs> So I'm Commissioner Hammerschmidt. Go ahead. Does it need to be re-noticed if we don't have a date certain? And is there like, is there any sort of issue with like the amount of time that we would need? Like, would that potentially delay it even further if the, the petitioner puts everything together and then they're like ready, but there's not enough time to re-notice? No. There, so there is a time with the re-notice, but that's it's months, it might be like six months and we're not gonna to get to that point. So we would not need to re-notice it because we had the public hearing uh, here tonight. Um, it'd be one of those items that again, Planning Commission could open up uh, additional public hearing, continue the public hearing if, but that it, all the issues were addressed tonight. I mean, there is no public hearing, so you would not need to, it would not be re-noticed. We would not need to re-notice it. Even if we don't have a date. Even if we don't have a date. Correct. Unless we're talking, again, is, if it's six months down the line, then yes, but we're not talking about that kind of time period. We're talking about weeks, um, you know, maybe a month here. So, yeah, no, that, that 
but that is always a, a concern, right? Again, because there's certain limitations on on staff uh, the scheduling just based on the limits of uh, public notices. But the second, that's why I say the first meeting. Well, we wouldn't even notice it either way. But um, yeah, so I'll stop talking. But to answer your question, no, there's no consent. Okay. okay, thank you. And then I don't want to belabor the point on the dumpsters next to the park. Understanding that that is where the dumpsters have always been located, but I just don't think, I mean, it feels almost like a nuisance to have a dumpster with smell next to something that you're basically saying is like a public good as a public space. I just don't think people would necessarily use the space if it's right next to a dumpster. So it's not really like the visual thing for me. It's more just like, like from the adjacent property, it's more just like the fact that you're locating a dumpster next to a public space. Any other comments about the proposal, which is to uh, postpone until the 2nd of February, 2-2-21? Um, Mr. Kowalski, let's do a roll call vote on the proposal to postpone. So again, this is to the February 2nd date, correct? To the February 2nd date, because I've not heard any okay. motion to amend that. I make a motion to amend that. I think what we have to do, because it's already been moved, and the mover has not changed that, I think we need to vote it up or down, and then there can be another proposal, if it is unsuccessful, to a different date. Commissioner Milstein. Since I moved it, I would be open to whatever Commissioner Abrams has to, <laughs> uh, to a fr potentially to a friendly amendment, depending on what friendly amendment to postpone to a date uncertain. Sounds good. And it sounds like Commissioner Sauvé was okay with that. Great. So now we are moving to postpone to a date uncertain whenever you can get back to us reasonably. Um, Commissioner Gibrandel, discussion of this. You're so muted still. Within reason in terms of our agenda, as well, because none of us wants to stay up until one o'clock to be able to get you on the first January meeting. I know time is money, but it also is, you know, difficult for us if we're up past midnight because we have six agenda items that are all big and beefy too. And so I just want to put in, <laughs> we have limits also in terms of that. So, uh, you know, if they can get it in, you know, and, and it's a second meeting in February and, and we can stay within reasonable hours, that's fine with me, but I don't want to stay up past midnight doing it just to be able to get it in. To January, I guess I just want to put that on the table because we don't know what our if you had you had intimated, um, uh, Mr. Kowalski, that w one of those meetings was really full. I can't remember which one. Was it the first one? In the first one. In January? Yeah, yeah. So if there's room in the in the second one. That that's great. I'm all for that. I just don't want it to be a huge pile on. And I appreciate that. Again, I, I ultimately it is up to the planning manager. His call uh, whether and I'm not entirely aware what's for the 15th, but again, we, we have this, we wanna get it addressed. We don't like things hanging around any longer than, than we have to, but again, we know that you guys have concerns, petitioner has concerns, staffing, but we will do our best to get it on as soon as possible. Let's vote on it. I think uh, based on the discussion, I think we can probably do a voice vote. That's okay on the po postponement. Uh, although if we postpone, actually let's do a roll call just because if we postpone it, then we're done um, discussing it. So go ahead with a roll call vote of the postponement to a date uncertain. Thank you. Yes. To hear this. Thank you. Commissioner Arons. Yes. Commissioner Dish. Yes. Commissioner uh, Sove. Yes. Commissioner Lee. Yes. Commissioner Gib Randall. Yes. Commissioner Mills. Yes. Commissioner Hammerschmidt. Yes. Commissioner Milstein. Yes. And Commissioner Clark. Yes. Okay, item is postponed to an uncertain date, but as soon as possible. We'll see you then, but it will be in the new year. So happy new year. It will. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we are done with the new business and on to other business. Um, these two items won't have public hearings um, because they are effectively communications to council. So the first item, 10A, 
is an update um, of a response to City Council Resolution R20-260, which is the site plan review thresholds. Mr. Kowalski, do you have a report for us? No, not really. I mean, I'm here for, I can answer some questions, um, but really as uh, Chair Mills had indicated, these are really update memos. They're meant to communicate the status to uh, City Council. These, uh, as you know, we've had uh, the, re for the requirement part of what head council had originally directed is to kind of have reports back at different stages. So this one would be reported back to council before the end of this year. <clears throat> so I'm also available for any comments. Um, it, it's the same with the next communication as well, really. Um, these, they both have the same intended effect. So um, yeah, that's really all I have. But again, I, I can answer some questions. I may not have a lot of the details, but I can certainly take notes and, and get, get a response back to you. And as a reminder for all of us, this is um, the communication that was shared with us two weeks ago. Um, Mr. Leonard, yes. during his staff communication, gave us a draft of that, and it was also circulated later today, kind of as part of the packet. So, um, so that's what were the the site plan thresholds. I'm going to read the motion, and then I saw Commissioner Dish. So then we'll be in discussion. Um, the motion is the Ann Arbor City Planning Commission hereby recommends the following update to City Council on Resolution R20-260 and summarizes Planning Commission's intent for proposed amendments. And then it's attached to the document. Moved by Commissioner Milstein, seconded by Commissioner Abrams. We are in discussion. Commissioner Dish, would you like to start? Just a, a couple of quick questions. Um, would the so the idea of adopting an FAR threshold would that would would it be possible to this I'm I'm thinking about this in relation to the work session that we had on ADUs would it be at all likely or possible that that threshold would be generous enough that you could actually do an ADU without needing a full blown site plan and I think some people might see that as a good thing and some might see it as a bad. I'm just asking to clarify that. Um, and then the one other thing was, I would have asked this earlier in the day in private and I'm just gonna go ahead and say that I couldn't quite understand from the way it was written on the, on the two add-on parts where it spoke about planning a commission approval of by right site plans and my assumption is i think i'm interpreting this right from what i understand from the previous drafts we had presented that the idea there is that there would be that that we're talking about recommending um some projects that would only have to clear planning commission if they are by right and not have to go on to council the way it's written it's a little confusing because it sounds like not even go to planning commission but i don't think that's what's the intent i think the intent is that planning commission makes the decision on certain by right site proposals and i just wanted to clarify that um, so those are my two questions good that, second question first that that is correct i mean um yes <laughs> as it was meant for planning commission and not but we'll make sure that that's that's clear um, the first question regarding the aid, the ADUs, uh, the threshold. So your question was really, um, it, does this remove the required the threshold for an ADU for a full site plan? Um, is there well, okay. So the idea it, here, yeah, maybe I. I'm sorry if I if I wasn't clear. The idea here, it looked like that to expand the development activities that would be exempt. Mm -hmm. And one approach to doing that would be to set a threshold of FAR below which you wouldn't need a site plan review, right? And so I'm just asking, would that threshold be generous enough that an ADU could conceivably fit under it? Am I making sense? Yes, I, I, think, I think so. And I'll add maybe additional commissioners too. But so, so, the, FA, so the ADUs, that when we when we've been mentioning the ADUs Commission and Council, those for the residential areas. So for like the single family and, and two families. So these changes that are before you here do not change that. They they don't have any effect on the the, the singular family. 
uh, the single family. And there are the separate set of 80 ADU revisions that will be going forward. So what these would be, because right now, um, these are dealing mainly with the site plans for the, you know, the larger projects that three units and above. So single and two family do not require site plans at any time. Now the ADUs do have a, a process that they go through, which is one that we've been trying to condense over years, but it's not, it's not the same as the site plan thresholds. So it is kind of a different process. So this itself would not have any effect on the ADUs in single or two families. Um, so they're kind of, it's, it's another avenue that we're looking at is the ADU revisions, but that's separate from this. So uh, I hope that helps. Does that answer your question? And, and commissioners, if I missed anything on that, please let me know. <laughs> it's a great question. Any other feedback or edits to the document before we vote on effectively advancing it as written to City Council? I'll just say I think it reflects um, what we've discussed. And I think also importantly, it encourages us to evaluate and consider things knowing that this is the first step. <laughs> There's more work. We're giving ourselves a whole lot more work by forwarding it. But I think it's also our opportunity to ask council to weigh in. And if there are things, the council effectively that tasked us with this is not the council that is before us now. And so um, Commissioner Dish, since you will be on that body that receives this, you are both forwarding it to, you're forwarding it to yourself effectively. But I hope, you know, going forward if there are things on here that are higher priority in your minds um, or things that aren't aren't priorities that that would be good feedback for us because you know our work plan is quite full and also to highlight that the two things that are enumerated at the end were not within our remit but what we heard a lot as opportunities um that again so that i'm i'm happy that they're in there but also knowing where the 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 council feels um, we might focus our efforts initially would be helpful. Um, I think we can take a roll call vote on this, Mr. Kowalski. Okay, uh, Commissioner Abrams. Yes. Commissioner Dish. Yes. Commissioner Sove. Yes. Commissioner Lee. Yes. Commissioner Gibrandle. Yes. Commissioner Mills. Yes. Commissioner Hammersmith. Yes. And uh, Commissioner Milstein. Yes. And Commissioner Clark. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thumbs right. up also work, Commissioner Clark. Sometimes we have to do that. Thank so you. that's okay. <laughs> okay. Thank All you right. Very much. <laughs> Item 10B, um, we're getting lots of communications off to council. This is the C1A, C1AR zoning district analysis um, and response to the city council resolution. Mr. Kowalski, is there a, a presentation or anything on this one? No, I have, I have the same report kind of. It's just um, kind of the memo before, before you hear tonight. So no, I don't actually have a report to give other than that. And Again, I'm available for questions and comments. All right. Um, again, there's not a public hearing on this, but uh, we did have some comments earlier about this. Um, so I'll read the motion. Uh, the city, Ann Arbor City Planning Commission hereby approves the following update in response to City Council Resolution R20-267 and summarizes Planning Commission intent for proposed ordinance amendments. Moved by Commissioner Milstein, seconded by Commissioner Sauve. You guys are fast tonight. Uh, discussion. Commissioner Dish. Yeah, again, um, a couple of questions that I would have tried to ask of you earlier in the day, normally, so I didn't waste time. But um, so I, I wondered, what was behind the removal of premium eligibility? And was that actually in order to set a height cap? Because um, I know sometimes premiums mean that you get to go higher than normal. And so I was curious about that. 
And then also just based on the some of the feedback that we're getting, um, I, f I sense that there will be concern raised that any portion of the site within 300 feet of a residential zoning district could go as high as 10 stories. I sense that there will be concern about that. There's gonna be concern that we keep these as live zoning designations anyway. And I think that there's a reasonable question as to whether or not these won't simply be supplanted by T1 when we finish T1. Um, and these may never even come into play. These may not come into play in the next year. So this whole discussion may be moot, but I just wanted to raise the first thing just as a, as a question I didn't understand, which I would have asked you during the day if I'd done that. And the, the last one, just to voice the concern that I think I'm hearing from constituents about height. Okay. Um, unfortunately, so the, the first question you said removal of the green elements, was that the? No, it's removal of premium eligibility. Premium. So, right. So I, I wondered if that was an attempt to restrict height because when we, when we, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when a, when a developer says, well, I'm going to do X number of affordable housing, we say, oh, you can go X number of floors. And so I just wondered at the motivation for re removal of premium eligibility, also because some of the criticism that we're getting of these zoning districts is that unlike PUDs, um, once we offer density by right, we can't extract concessions like affordable housing. Am I putting that clearly or in? Uh, okay. Uh, yes. Uh, unfortunately, I, I don't have an answer. Um, I, I, I was not involved with the, this, the developing of this, the memo and the study behind it. Um, I don't, if other commissioners that have been involved with the process could, and I don't have an answer for you, uh, Commissioner Dish, but I, I can definitely get, I will, we will have an answer before and we can report that back to you regarding um, why that the premiums and that removal, but unfortunately, I don't have that right now. I wasn't the main staff member working on that, so I apologize. Um, I don't know if other commissioners have anything to add regarding that, but I will get, or we'll be able to get a communication back to you that has the answer, because it's a good question regarding the premiums. My sense, Commissioner Dish, is that having been on ORC, which looked at this a couple, I mean, it came before us, right, uh, as a whole, but before you were on commission, so, um, uh, we kind of talked about it a couple times at a working session. Ultimately, came we didn't have tons of discussion about it because we thought like uh, we didn't we didn't have we we thought we should give a quick response. We didn't necessarily see this as so broken, and I think that's reflected in here that there's that there are that there may be an element like this typology is something that we don't want to entirely throw out. Um, but the discussion on the premiums was. I think both that FA, like with a premium doesn't always come additional height, but in some of these districts, there is not a limitation. And that's actually one of the concerns is that there's not a height limit as there is in the D2. And so putting those things together, that was providing some additional protection is my recollection of all of that. And to your second point, I think actually like the last two bullets in my mind go together and are under like, um, the one helps make it a little bit clearer um, that if you want to be a hundred feet tall, you have and you're you're adjacent to a residential district. If you're adjacent to a residential district, you now have to have based on the multiplier that's in that second to last bullet, you have to be a hundred feet set back from that setback line. So you so even if you are right next door, it, in order to be that high, like for every foot over 30 feet, you have to move back. So maybe it's maybe it's 70 feet then if I, then I did the math a little bit off. Um, but this is providing an additional layer of protection over that. And again, the idea is that this is borrowing from what we have in other neighboring districts, right? So we're not recreating the wheel here, but also that we know that this concern over unlimited height 
potentially it's not it's not often used and developers often when they're proposing rezoning or when we see rezoning to one of these classifications have volunteered a height limit and so that seemed not controversial and to hopefully quell some of the concerns is my recollection of those discussions and i'm seeing some nods from commissioner milstein but commissioner sove is also on orc so she can add in where i was had off nuances I'll just say, yeah, like the premiums was the uncertainty, especially in neighborhood areas, because the premiums only apply to D1, D2, and these designations. And so to remove it from this, it only applies to D1, D2, which has a clearer boundary, where the boundary of this is designated following, you know, the campus area. So what it did was for any neighboring, especially residential, by removing the premiums, any resident that could be next to this zoning designation, they know the density that's gonna happen on that site. There's no possibility to go denser or higher than those two limits. So I think that was it too, because increasing FAR, all of a sudden you're seeing a lot more on that site than what is zoned for, but premiums are still by right. If you do this, you do that. So I, though, that's why it's just like eliminate it because it's less uncertainty. I think that's the only other kind of thing I'd add about the premiums. Commissioner Abrams. Hi, um, I wanted to just get a little clarity on the process. So this evening, what we're doing is we're voting on a memo, which is an update to city council. And then, and in a way, we're not committing to anything. We have a we have a list of things that we are We've said we might consider, but we're not kind of locked into anything. So the reason I'm asking, so I'll just say this too, is there, there are like details that I would like to discuss, but based on communication we've received, the, the um, you know, community members you've called into us, but my sense is that tonight is not necessarily the moment to hash that out because what we're doing is we're essentially just agreeing to discuss this further in, in the coming year but I'd like some just affirmation or confirmation, I guess. That. Yeah, I think I, from staff's point of view, that's exactly correct. Is that really, this is just, it's just meant to be kind of an update memo is that this is what planning commission we've been working on. These are some of the areas that we want to explore, but it's by no means, they're not code amendments. They're nothing like, yeah, by agreeing, I, I, we can understand the concern, like just by accepting or voting to pass this communication on, doesn't mean you're agreeing to any of these things that are in here. It's just really saying, this is kind of what we've come up with over the past uh, year or so that we've been looking at this. This is our update and this is areas further that we're going to explore. So you're correct that it's not committing or committing you or any planning commissioner to anything really. It's, so it maybe I just would like to say, I, I, I support kind of just uh, voting for the memo, but I do you think, I just want to make sure that when we bring this up for discussion next year, we do take the time to go through the points that are being raised um, in the communications that we're receiving and kind of address those concerns, which are like height relative to D2 or um, affordable housing as we're talking, we're kind of hashing that out right now. I think that's helpful um, and kind of how to, um, what we think the appropriate criteria for evaluation would be in when considering whether something qualifies as, uh, in a rezoning petition. So um, I don't wanna kind of hold us up tonight. I don't think it's appropriate for tonight, but I do wanna just maybe go on record saying that I hope we have time, have time to have that um, conversation when we do talk about these in the future. Commissioner yes. Milstein. Sorry, um, Mr. Kowalski, I cut you off though. Did you have something to, okay. Oh, now, Commissioner Abrams, um, so part of the reason why I think it's good to send memos back versus us actually taking the next several months to come up with this plan is because there's been uh, a change in city council. And so what we don't wanna do is we don't wanna work for the next several months on something um, and then find ourselves that city council voted down because things changed. So um, because, you know, for example, at our last meeting, we talked about EDUs. We worked for months and months and months on EDUs. By the time it got to city council, they voted it down. And we spent so much time when 
Uh, personally, I like the idea of sending memos so that we can get some feedback from council so that we know where we stand because our work plan is already long enough. So let's work on things that are gonna be productive versus things that we're just wasting our time more or less. So yes, if, if council is still on board with all this and uh, Commissioner Dish, I hope that you'll get us feedback um, you know, within the next month or so so that we can figure out what we need to concentrate on um, so that we're not spending time having a conversation about something that's really not gonna go anywhere. Just because I know we have way more pressing items on our to-do list right now um, that I'd like to get to versus something that's going to go nowhere. Maybe just kind of briefly respond. So thank you. That's very, very helpful context. Um, is, is there something in the memo that we need to say that where we kind of request feedback or is that already written into the kind of mechanism? There's nothing in there that kind of formally says that, but. No, there, there isn't, but we will, we will get feedback from Commissioner okay. Brett, Brett will and yeah, we will have feedback from, from the council on it. Okay, that sounds great. Thank you. Commissioner Melstein. By no means am I saying that we're wasting time looking at these things. I just want to make sure that we prioritize what we look at. Um, and there may be other things that council thinks that we should be working on versus some of these items. Yeah, that's, that's a great, great point, Commissioner Stein, because we do, you're right, I mean, the work program's long, so these kind of memos provide that kind of touch base with council at various points to let them know exactly what was said, whether we're going right in the right direction or things need to change. Commissioner Dish. So you're also asking really for a little bit of an indication of priority. And so if there's some overlap between the issues that are raised, uh, the concerns that are raised around these designations and uh, T1, council might, you might want to know whether council would like planning commission to really, you know, work on this and get C1A and C1AR right or work a little harder on T1 and, you know, put, you know, put this one, you know, obviously we're not going to, but the issue is that maybe we can address these issues of density adjacent to residential through another way, um, rather than trying to refine this, these zoning designations that might be outmoded if we move forward with T1 is that I'm not, I'm trying not to, um, I'm just trying to get a little bit of clarity about where the, what the choices are that, that you would, or I, mean, I feel like it would be useful for council to prioritize, but to prioritize one needs a list of trade-offs. And I'm asking for a little bit of guidance on it, um, that if it's possible, but maybe that's not appropriate to ask for. And, and if not, that's okay. I would, I would withdraw that question. I think the basic trade-off in my mind is staff time and our time, right? There's only so many hours in the day. So I think that that's the, you know, and, and actually I'm Commissioner Abrams, I'm really happy that you raised this point because act, the way this ends, this is stuff that like was in our packet this week, but we hadn't looked at it. The way this ends, it says that we do, that we will explore the, the final bulleted list of four things and anticipate um, presentation for change, you know, ordinance changes by April 1st. I wonder if that's a, if that, that does not suggest to me, like, that we're asking council to call us off <laughs> or say, like, go forward. And so I think one of the questions that I would have back to Mr. Leonard um, is whether this is indeed part of our if that's how it's structured in our work plan and that we anticipate being able to get to this and all of those other things, or if this is one where closer to what Commissioner Milstein was saying is like, give us some feedback counsel. Like, do you think these are, these four things are okay? I would also suggest though, that to Commissioner Abrams point, like this is not, this is, there are things beyond this list that pe that we have heard people ask for right, that you were talking about digging into. And some of that is what is the original intent in the language of these districts. And a lot of that, that the things that we're talking about here on this list are not going to solve is 
where our master plan calls for this specific district or where it doesn't, where it doesn't call for this district. Um, that is, I think that this concern over whether this is an appropriate district to apply is going to come back and back. And so actually one of the, the critique that I had of this is that I remember perhaps one of our working sessions where we said like, we're not ready to scrap this until we look at the master plan again. Like we think it's okay, but, but really before we determine where is, where's an appropriate district for it, like we need a review of where that might look. And so I recognize that that's not on in the cards budgetarily right now. And so maybe that's why that's not in here, but I, that's the thing that I kind of feel like is missing is to say like, maybe it's kind of between the lines about this evolution of where campus is and that, but it, it does not, it's not necessarily tied back to the plan, but, but I can, given having read through the communications that we've gotten, that is a, and the, and the basis on which we rezone this, the concern is not over the existing things that are zone C1 and C1AR. It's about when we rezone, people say this is not what's called for in the master plan. And so that, and it's what element of the master plan are we talking about, <laughs> right? And is it that, so um, I think that that's gonna be a continued concern. And I wonder if it wouldn't be wise to at least flag to council that like from planning's perspective, we, we see that as one of the challenges going forward. That even this list of four things is not gonna solve all the problems. Commissioner Sylvay. Yeah, that's good. how I read it is like this is a two step communication that there's we're, we're sending a memo before we do additional work on the harder part, which is about questions of master plan and placement and all those things that requires a lot more staff time. The four points that we're looking at really kind of tidy up what this district is and I think are very feasible and reasonable ordinance changes to accomplish by April 1st um, without losing the intent of the thing um, while addressing some of the, the concerns that we're starting to see. Um, but to Commissioner Milstein's point, this gives us a checkpoint um, to go back to council and say, these are the bigger issues that we're seeing. Is that something that you wanna pursue now that we've highlighted what they are because when this was brought forward to us, it was a different form of counsel directing this, hearing different things than what we might hear. So we wanna have that checkpoint to have the conversation of you heard one thing, we looked at it, we're seeing this instead. Are we on the same page? Are we on a different page? How do we move forward? Is it a priority to move forward? Or are there other similar things that we should be looking at? So I feel comfortable that it, like, it balances those two. We can take some, some smaller actions because we think it's appropriate to keep up, you know, as an available tool in our master plan, but there's bigger issues and we want to have a checkpoint before we spend a lot of time on what might be a big issue or what might not be relative to council also weighing in on what priorities are. So it does a twofold is how I kind of read into it. And so I like for me, even with this, I feel like those four last bullet points are feasible action items and very specific ones um, that we might get, you know, input back from city council. Don't do those, but otherwise we're prepared to do them if the feedback is, yes, this sounds good. So. Commissioner Abrams. I wonder if it would make sense to just propose an amendment where the, um, the last sentence before those four bullet points currently reads, this is proposed to be accomplished in the following manner. That might be revised to say, um, uh, like, okay, I'm not gonna get the words right the first time, but you know, ways to achieve this might include, but are not limited to <laughs> the following, list those bullets. And then maybe the last paragraph would could be amended to say, to actually explicitly request um, feedback from council and take out this hard April 1st date. Um, but yeah, I would be interested to hear what others think about that possibility. 
Commissioner Milstein. I'm 100% on board, um, especially with that hard date, as I think about it, April 1st, in all reality, uh, we have a lot on our plate. Uh, and there, and, and also in all reality, we also only have three working sessions before this date um, and three ORC meetings before this date. Um, there's still a lot to be discussed, especially depending on the feedback that we receive from council. So I definitely, I'm in total agreement of removing that date. Um, and your other changes, uh, Commissioner Abrams, are great. Um, even though it's the first draft, it was a great draft. You did. You're muted. Shoot. <laughs> no, you're fine. <laughs> so you could, uh, thank you. Uh, that's what you were saying. I hear that that's a motion to amend that would be seconded. Is that fair? I make a motion to amend. Seconded by Commissioner Milstein. Um, discussion on the amendment, which would um, not limit the potential changes to those in the enumerated four list of four and strike the certain date certain at the end. Commissioner so Dish. Sorry. sorry, go ahead, Commissioner or Mr. I was trying to make sure, sorry, that I got a uh, part of the wording exactly that is kind of not limited to. I mean, I think that was kind of the main uh, uh, point you're trying to get across for the, the first change was that you wanted to include kind of those four, but it's like not limited to just those four. It could be other ones. But maybe if Commissioner Dish has additional language you want to add to that or? No, I just wanted to actually. I, I felt like we should read, read the amended language. Okay, yeah, that's we what voted I voted on it. <laughs> um, so, so instead of saying this is proposed to be accomplished in the following manner, uh, my amendment proposes that it would say this may be accomplished. No, wait, hold on. What did I say? <laughs> um, oh. Accomplishing this, no. Something about may include, but not limited to, but I need help remembering how I, how I phrased it. Um, we propose the following. Include. Yeah, but I wanted that little, you know, includes, but is not limited to yeah. the following. This, this may be accomplished in, um, oh. If I may interject, um, th this is proposed to be accomplished in the following manners, uh, including but not limited to removal of. Is right. that what? That's fine. Include, yeah. So, so the phrase "including but not limited to" is yeah. probably cool. including but not limited to. So. And then I was proposing to leave the four bullet points as is, and amend the last sentence. I didn't propose specific language, but I can try and do that now. Um, I would, uh, instead of, so instead of saying with anticipated presentation of ordinance changes, blah, 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 I would say um, pending feedback from city council on regarding this memo or something. So this is after the comma, rather than with anticipate, it's pending feedback from city council. Correct. Uh, the whole thing is direction to. instead of feedback. Maybe. Direction. Yeah. Would it be helpful to outline direction on the two kind of parts, the four bullets and the two, four? seven bullets above or just ask for direction overall? I don't know. I think overall or, or, or leaving it on leaving it vague allows them to provide feedback on or direction on any of it. In reality, actually, now that's looking at this and the way that kind of Lisa laid it out. The first, uh, sorry, Commissioner Sauvé laid it out. The first seven bullets, right? Like effectively what we suggest, if you numbered them, let's say 
one, two, right? All we're really doing is addressing bullet number five. That's, there are a whole bunch of different things that could be done. We're saying number five is the low hanging fruit that may take away like a lot of the heartburn, but it's not going to solve this. And so maybe, I mean, I think it's important that does not come through. We know that, but that I don't think is coming through here. And so I kind of feel like we need that. And, and what we need to say to council is effectively, here are the four bullets that you can do to address number five. But maybe number five is not the right thing. Like, and we don't think that number, like doing number five alone is going to solve the whole problem. There's a lot of other things that could be done. And I think what we really want is feedback on all of it. Do we want, is that fair? Direction on all of it. Which seems to me like we're going to have to edit this a little bit more and that we probably shouldn't be doing it on the fly right now at 10.15. But um, Commissioner Sobe. I mean, if, if we just leave it open-ended, I guess that's where we leave it open-ended and just say direction to all of it. The benefit of having a council member on Planning Commission is to relay that sort of filter to it um, to kind of unpack it more in the discussion in City Council. Or we could be more explicit about these things are not specific ordinance recommendations. We have yet to um resolve into you know recommendations is it something that city council would like additional effort towards and in what priority so like we could go that far maybe yeah if like we take another day to look at that or we just say look at it all and commissioner dish relays all of this <laughs> discussion i'm open to either i'm just opening up the conversation of couple different ways to go. Commissioner Milstein, and then Commissioner Dish, there was kind of a question to you, if you want to answer it. Um, so, and for some reason I can't find it right now. Um, the, uh, didn't we, didn't the original motion from city council ask for a response by the end of this year? I think so I, I don't think we have an option of, I think we do need to get back to them uh, by the end of this year, which is two weeks away and we don't have any additional meetings. So unfortunately, I think we are going to have to do this on the fly. And I'm all in favor of sort of leave, leaving it open-ended and having Commissioner Dish deliver the message to City Council uh, with the memo. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking again. I, I hadn't, I didn't go back and relook at the memo, but it's an extremely it's an extremely broad, <laughs> like the, <laughs> the first half is really broad. So um, I would interpret that what this memo is asking for is, are you interested in us further exploring bullet points, the, the last four bullet points and translating those into ordinance in some amount of time? And then there was a, we had a very broad ranging discussion, which uh, includes a lot of other things. And do you want us to keep talking about those things um, and develop some ordinances, develop some like more tidy fixes? I mean, but I think the expression that I've heard from Commissioner Sove is here's a tidy feasible fix that helps provide some security for people who who have concerns about this zoning district but it it really doesn't reach the very broad range of concerns that have been raised about this but do we need to reach that broad range of concerns by fixing this zoning designation or are there other ways that we could go about that that might be more a more fruitful use of planning commission's time I, what I'm, yeah, I think, yeah, I, I, right. I think we want to, 
we don't want to launch a giant thing on council either because that can go till two in the morning. So, <laughs> um, but I do so, but, you know, but I think this is a great, you know, this is an update, right? This is an update. This is what was asked for. We have a great set of tidy fixes that people can say yes or no on. And then there's a request. Do you want us to keep talking about requiring mixed uses? Do you want us to keep talking about how much the city has changed? And is if you want us to have that conversation, which I think we do want to have that conversation, is this the venue for it? Or is there another venue for that conversation? I think that's what you're asking for. So I think I can, um, because the, the, yeah, I think Commissioner Mills called my attention to the fact that there's definitely a distinction between the seven and the four. <laughs> Direction on the four is straightforward. Direction on the seven is broad. And so um, I will communicate that. Great. Yeah. And the, in the, and I think where this all originated from is we're talking about what to put after the comma in that very last sentence. Mm -hmm. um, because that's what the kind of the, the motion before us. Um, mm -hmm. Mr. Kowalski, do you have where we left it? There we go. Um, well, I have the, the first part, which is you know, above the bullet points. You want that that summary, how we left it, or which part are you saying after? I you think we're discussing about taking out the date. But I think it's described above are the proposed amendments that will be explored and considered by the Planning Commission pending direction from City Council. Right. Yes. Yeah, so that's after, directly after. By the city council pen direction. That's directly after that comma in planning commission. Correct. So the whole right. last part of that sentence with anticipate presentation, that's gone. Yeah. It just says pending direction from city council. Right. And and the way I would read that is that planning commission is asking for direction immediately on the four, because the four are the proposed amendments, right? And then there's a whole nother piece of this memo that we can also give direction on, but those are not proposed amendments those are pretty big action items and Correct. it would be helpful to hear whether this is the venue to con continue those action items or whether there are other projects that might better address those action items so do you want another sentence or are you just going to verbally communicate that i'm going to verbally communicate that right unless you guys want to make another sentence yeah thank you for calling my attention to that Thank you, Commissioner Sauvé. <laughs> All right, so we have the proposal to amend this, which would add, including but not limited to, before the bullet list of four, alter that last sentence after the comma to simply pending direction from city council. Any or more discussion on those two changes to this? memo all in favor of the amend of the amendment this is not for the whole thing to forward there can still be discussion this is just so particularly newbies know kind of what this is this is just for the amendment um we'll just do a voice vote so raise your hand or say yes yes yes, yes. i see everybody's hand so there can be no one opposed no one opposed okay so now the motion that we as before us is amended so it's it's the the motion is to forward this memo that we have now amended any other discussion of the amended memo all right let's vote and be, i think we can just do a voice vote on this one too all in favor raise your hand or say yes Yes. 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 There's Commissioner Lee. Okay. Um, there can be no one opposed because I saw everybody's hand. So it is approved. It is, it passes. Okay. Thank you. Um, let me go back to the agenda. We're in item number 11, which is public comment. This is an opportunity for persons to speak for up to three minutes about an, any item of interest. 
public comment can be made by calling 877-853-5247 and then entering meeting ID 995-7768-1367. City staff will select callers that have raised their hand. You do that by pressing star nine on your phone. Um, staff will call on you using the last three digits of your telephone number. Um, as usual, please move to a quiet area, mute any background noises so that we can hear you clearly. Uh, please also state your name and address for the record at the beginning of your comments and the two people on the line have their hands raised. Caller ending in 534, you will have three minutes to address the Planning Commission. Hi, this is Tom Stahlberg again, 1202 Traver Street. Um, well, I guess you've already passed something. I wish I could have helped you along before then. Um, I'd make your job real easy. I would uh, scrap the list and scrap the uh, the two zoning categories altogether. Uh, spend your priority time on uh, transit-supported development instead. Um, there's only been two uses of these, you know, maybe C1A in 20 years and C1AR in 50 years. Uh, the C1A was turned down and C1AR was approved, but both were inappropriate. Um, there were some things in uh, the Garnett, the C1A application, that made that a non-viable application. Uh, it starts to stray in some other issues like conditional zoning, but that was a, a non-legal conditioning zoning that was um, proposed for that. Um, so it's a good thing that it didn't pass. It would really have the city in, in significant jeopardy and would not have stood up in court. So what do we do with C1A and C1A if they've only been used twice or attempted to be used twice and, and, and inappropriately? Let's just get rid of them. <laughs> you have no loss there, but you've already passed that moment. So I think what you're trying to do is you're trying to make something palatable that it's fine where it's left alone, where it currently exists. It's small lots. So you don't have to worry about the FAR pushing the high, high height limit anyhow. Um, and, and they're urban core areas. And that's why the premiums are for D1, D2, C1A, and C1AR, because they are urban core areas. So you can leave the premiums there. If you keep them where they belong, then you solve the whole problem. So I think the real issue here was not to try to make them palatable so they could be spread everywhere. It was to corral them so that these things who, which could become not palatable elsewhere. You know, there's specifically C1AR, you know, there's all these small lots. So the FAR can only get so big, but if you let it spread to elsewhere where it could be big lots, then all of a sudden you get into the height issues because of the FAR. So you wouldn't have to put the fixes on if you just corral these to where they really belonged in the first place. So you still are kind of stuck looking at that issue and this comes back to you, where do these really belong? Uh, and that's, you know, that's probably the biggest issue and that solves the most problems. But you've, uh, you've sent it off to council. That's a done deal. You've passed the motion and I know you want to get them by the end of the year. So you've accomplished that. Um, but as we look at this further, I'd really like to provide a, a lot more input on um, why it really is an appro inappropriate to spread these past where they were really intended to do. Uh, and I urge you uh, in the time between now and when this comes back to you after direction from council to read the documents that we provided, to read the actual uh, lawsuit filing, to read the November 2017 letter from Susan uh, Friedlander, which includes a report from the previous, uh, from a prior planning director to planning commission. There is a wealth of information in there and it is all conclusive that these, these do not belong to be spread outside of where they belong, which is a very limited area. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Caller ending in 556, you will have three minutes to address the Planning Commission. Hi, this is Ralph McKee. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I'm at 1116 Red Oak. I have a similar take to this uh, that Tom did, but from a little different perspective. I, I, I think the original direction from council, if you go, if you looked at the, or we're at, we're at the meeting that, that this was sent to you from, the direction was pretty clear. 
figure out how to restrict these or get rid of them. And somehow in the initial discussions and the initial comments from staff, it took on an, a completely different direction, which was more like, how can we expand these to use them and still make them palatable? That's exactly the opposite of the direction that was given. And that's what's causing you the heartburn here in terms of how to figure out how to deal with it because the original direction has, has not been followed. And the, the, the point really is if, if these, these cause all sorts of decisional problems and, and zoning twists and turns, if you take them out of the original area where they were originally intended, if you try to make them fit other places, you run into all sorts of problems, which you've correctly identified and been told of others. And if you go back to the original direction, you can cause or solve a lot of problems. And I, I got to say, the last bit of the discussion, that's one of the most confusing discussions that I've heard in a long time about what to, how to grapple with it. And I appreciate the, the, the problem, but it's sort of a self-inflicted problem. And if you want to prioritize, you know, you'd be a lot better off getting rid of that problem. There is, however, something that you, that all of the materials and all the thinking that you're doing will be very productive. And that's because virtually all the issues that Tom and I have identified are front and center when you're dealing with the transit uh, supported or transit oriented or T1 or whatever you want to call it. All of those, or many of those issues are front and center. So thinking about the issues that you're doing will be very, very helpful. And, and so I would encourage you to do what Tom just indicated, which is to read those documents, which will give you background, which will be totally applicable to your other problem, which is going to be your priority going forward, as, as I understand it. So that piece will be, will be helpful. I, I have one other sort of more a little bit lighter, but maybe not that light uh, comment about the process and what you're using your time for. I remember at the first or earlier council meeting, uh, a council member dish waving the book about the endless meetings and, and, and all that. And, and that that's light to some degree. I'll try to keep it that way. But you guys spent 35 minutes talking about what date to, to, to move the, the uh, Lewis Jewelers site plan review to. You spent 35 minutes on that. I just want to let you know that I'm not sure about the use of time if you want to prioritize and keep your meetings short. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't see anyone else on the line, so um, I will close the public comment period and move on to item number 12, which is commission proposed business. Is there any, Commissioner Milstein? I'm going to keep it very brief, and this is for Mr. Kowalski to take back to Mr. Leonard. Um, one of the items that was added to our uh, communication uh, late today was a letter from uh, the Village of Barton Hills saying that they are embarking on a master plan revision and also stating in there that they are planning to make revisions to their master plan. And one of the things that's happening right now is the Lower Town Area Mobility Study. Um, and it's very close to where the Village of Barton Hills is. So I think there's got to be some communication from the city in regards to that, that that study is happening, because I think we are going to want that study to be a part of their master planning process. And I don't know how that communication works, but uh, Mr. Kowalski, if you could just take that back to Mr. Leonard, um, and if he can address it at our next meeting, that'd be great. Thank you. Yes, I can. I mean, we have the the ability to comment obviously that's why they put it out there so yeah i will mention it to him and and we can um, update you on the next meeting of how that communication will go forward any others it's not really um proposed business as much as i want to thank city staff for stepping in tonight and taking on roles uh so mia Kristen. Matt and Chris filling Mr. Leonard's big shoes. Um, and Mr. Leonard, if you are watching us, speedy recovery. <laughs> um, I hope you're sleeping and not watching us, but just in case. Um, but also, like, legitimately, we are, I think, we're super fortunate to have such a professional staff who can 
do this. Um, so thank you. Thank you. We do what we can, but <laughs> I wish I could have answered more questions for you tonight, but, but thank you for the note. Yeah. Um, anything else? Also, I won't see you until the new year. So happy holidays and we'll see you in 2021. Um, because I think we're ready to move for a motion to adjourn. Moved by Commissioner Milstein, seconded by Commissioner Abrams. All those in favor, please say aye or raise your hand. Aye. 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 That's everyone. We are adjourned. Have a great rest yeah. of 2020.